Welcome everyone. We are now ready to go to start our meeting. And um, I just want to start by uh, calling the meeting to order and uh, we've got quorum, so I'll throw it over to the clerk to um, to do the land acknowledgement at this time. Thank you, Chair. We acknowledge the land we are meeting on is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabek, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. We also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. Thank you very much. Uh, commissioners, do you wish to declare a conflict of interest in accordance with the Municipal Conflict of Interest Act? If I see any gestures, I see none. Okay, and uh, now we're gonna move on to the minutes of February 10th, 2021. So I can please have someone to approve the minutes. And I see Commissioner uh, McKelvey as approving the minutes. All in favor, show of hands, that carries. Okay, as always, I just wanna remind you that um, this is an open meeting. And as we go through the agenda today, uh, you'll be required to make email requests to ask questions and to speak on items to the email address provided to you by the clerks. Each member has five minutes for question and five minutes to speak, and the timelines will be strictly adhered to, to be fair to everyone. If you wish to submit a motion on an item, please email your motion to the email address that you've been provided. You have also been provided with the appropriate contact information for technical troubleshooting and staff also have each of your phone numbers should you need to contact them for technical reasons or vice versa. So, um, so far, uh, so good. I, I hope that we don't have a lot of technical challenges today. Um, so we're going to now commence with the order paper, recognizing that we uh, have outside attendees for item five. Uh, people who would like to speak on that item, racial equity impact assessment of TTC enforcement activities and item six and seven of the agenda. Uh, being that the reports um, on the TTC bu green bus program, uh, those are both focused on that. I'm proposing that we deal with those three items at the beginning of today, the morning session, and um, then we deal with the, uh, the, the bundle, the two green bus items, obviously. And I'll hold those three reports in my name um, and then we'll recess for lunch and we'll come back this afternoon. One of the reasons for proposing that is because um, we have doctors involved in the uh, first item and uh, this is the time that they're available. So we're trying to honor their commitments and their, and their timelines. Um, after lunch, we'll proceed with the CEO's report and the ACAT report as well as a couple items, a couple, few more items that will be in camera presentations. So we're a little bit flip-flop today. Usually we do the opposite, so it's opposite day, but uh, given people's um, accommodating people's time, uh, time, we're doing it in this manner. Um, so I request a motion to adopt the order paper. All right, uh, Councillor Lai, uh, Commissioner Lai. <laughs> it's confusing. All right, so item five, you're both. Item five is what we're, where we're gonna start. Oh, I guess we need to go through the order paper. My apologies, um, just to see. I don't, I don't think there are. Clerk, could you just advise there's no, uh, there's enough there's speakers on every item. There's no items to be held or not held, correct? Uh, Chair, we have uh, speakers on item five and item six of the agenda today. The items that are not currently held are um, three, eight, nine, and 10. Okay, so should we just go through the order paper quickly here? Is it just a, we don't need to. Okay, so item five, um, I guess we'll start with that item. Racial equity impact assessment of TTC enforcement activities. And um, we do have, as I said earlier, registered speakers. I think we should start with, with our registered speakers. So I would ask the clerk to now call upon them. Uh, good morning. Uh, can you hear me okay? 
Uh, good morning. My name is Apensi uh, Wusabempa. I'm here with my colleague, Scott Wortley. Uh, we've been uh, tasked with and undertaken uh, the racial equity impact assessment uh, on behalf of the Toronto Transit Commission. Uh, we appreciate the opportunity to share the findings of our interim report with you. Can I please have that report called up? We have a PowerPoint presentation. Um, Sorry, um, can I? Sorry, Doctor. Can I just interrupt? We're actually um, we're uh, considering our public presentations, the deputants, right now. My apologies. Pardon me. Thank you. So our first deputant is Aleem uh, Thirani. So I've sent a request to unmute, and then please go ahead. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Okay, perfect. So my name is Aleem Sarani. I'm the executive board member at large in maintenance for ETU 113 representing 12,000 TTC employees. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak today. Uh, just some things I wanted to bring up. So ETU 113 fully supports the TTC's effort to eradicate racial bias and racial profiling in fair enforcement. At the same time, it is important that we recognize that there are other forms of systemic racism that harm the communities served by the TTC. My own story is a good example. I came from exactly the kind of neighborhood as these racialized riders who have been disproportionately targeted for fair enforcement. I actually come out of Councillor Jennifer McKelvey's ward. Um, so I grew up in a neighborhood like that and that could have been me, but I was fortunate enough. I got a job with the TTC as a summer student and worked my way up from an entry level job of a landscaper where now I am now in an elected position as the board member at large in maintenance uh, for ETU Local 113. This is a success story that I share with you with many other racialized workers in the TTC. Thousands of families from racialized backgrounds trust the TTC because their sons, daughters, neighbors, and friends have made good careers in the commission but those jobs are under threat. ATU 113 wrote to the commission back in December, raising our concern about the loss of jobs for racialized workers due to contracting out. The report you are considering today calls on the TTC to identify, prevent, and address racism in the workplace and in the delivery of services, and to build trust with black, indigenous, and racialized communities. You can build that trust by eliminating racism in fair enforcement and by ensuring that you continue to provide pathway to decent, secure employment to black, indigenous and racialized workers. The two go hand in hand. I would like to thank you for your time and I'm willing to take any questions if you may have any. Thank you very much. Are there any questions for the speaker? Uh, Commissioner Carroll. Uh, good morning, Aleem, and, and thanks for your comments. I'm wondering if you, just to flesh that out a little more, is is the concern that that when we when we do contract out a, a particular function within the TTC, that that uh, uh, the that the the hiring is less diverse? Are are you confident of the diversity hiring when we stay in house? So, so I'm, listen, I'm not sure I could answer that question, but I can give you my opinion, definitely. I think those, those entry-level positions that we're talking about, which are, let's say, we'll refer to semi-skilled, are usually mm -hmm. given to minorities, women, racialized, marginalized people who don't have the opportunity uh, due to maybe their, their, where they've immigrated from or don't have the skills or the tools or education but then they come into the TTC and these people are the people that are being targeted by fair enforcement as well because they come from these underprivileged areas. So wh when they come into these entry level positions, they are then uh, given an opportunity to get tuition aid, which the TTC provides and move into more skilled positions, therefore providing for their families where they can pay, pay for the fares and send their future generations, their kids, their grandkids to school to get better paying jobs with pension and benefits. And the city is always talking about being a model employee for that. So uh, by looking at both of these items, I think they go hand in hand. I hope that answered the question. 
So that's the issue. The issue is cross training and upward mobility in the organization. Something that 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 we can't do or even control it if we if we hand the function over to a contract. If you're contracting out, listen. There was an article for a uh, Ugandan refugee who worked for a contractor for TTC, okay, uh, at Wilson mm -hmm. Carlos for a company called TBM, who sanitized uh, the vehicles before they went into service to help prevent COVID contraction for public service for people that right. ride our subways. This employee was uh, worked for a contractor for I believe minimum wage, contracted COVID from work. Two weeks later, reported back to work and did not have a job. So it's like, what kind of employer are we are we promoting here? Somebody who's getting minimum wage and it caught COVID due to work, and when they return back to work, they don't have a job. I, I'm not sure that that's helping people. Thank you, thank you. I think that that, that illustrates it. Thanks, Celine. Thank you very much. Uh, we're going to move on to our next speaker, and I thank believe you for your it's time, everybody. Have a good day. Thank you. It's, I believe it's Alan Ewell, if I'm correct. Yes, Chair, the next speaker is Alan Ewell. We're just pulling up the presentation for um, Mr. Ewell. Hi there, can you hear me? Can. You can hear me? Can you hear us? Uh, yeah, I can hear you on the phone. Can you hear me? That's cool. Yeah, perfectly. Okay, so, okay, first slide. Madam Chair, since I have not met our latest board member, board member in person, I need to pr present this pr presentation in perspective. Next slide, please. I am a gray-haired, chubby white guy. Next slide, please. I'm also partly responsible for getting the TTC to start to actually handing out t tickets for fair evasion on the system. They said they're just handing out educational warnings. Next slide, please. So here we are. Next slide. To be fair, I believe that everybody in this meeting truly wants to improve this situation. But unfortunately, next slide, the TTC is a bureaucracy. And while the TTC may not have invented bureaucracy, they have perfected it. Next slide, please. This came out the same month as, as, as the report we're looking at. The TTC's HR department did this. Next slide. This is a posting for a TTC prosecutor and was on the TTC open website from April 1st until 11.59.59 last night. Next slide, please. The key, the first key function, job function listed on for this role is to coordinate, conduct, oversee, and administrate court prosecutions, prosecutions, charges laid by and behalf of TTC, fair inspectors, special constables, and Toronto police officers. Next slide, please. More than 20% of our enforcement data is made up of black and indigenous passengers. Having a TTC prosecutor can only make things worse right now. Next slide, please. This board has already heard about people feeling pressure to plead guilty to fair evasion charges. The filling of this TTC prosecutor position should be postponed for at least six to 12 months. Next slide, please. We cannot forget that fair evasion is still a problem on the TTC and it requires a multi-pronged solution. Next slide. Unfortunately, we've been focusing on only one, one fixation right now. Next slide. If someone buys a Metro Pass at the first of the month, that means for at least the next 29 days, there's no fare evasion from that customer. Next slide. In the real world, this is known as a margin, margin versus ratio issue, where a properly priced Metro Pass would lead to an overall increase in pass sales and overall increase in the dollars brought to the TTC's fare box. Next slide. I presented this board to the board before, but unfortunately the response from TTC staff and the board members has been less than overwhelming. Last slide. As you've been told before, the provincial average for the number of trips to break even on a monthly Metro Pass outside the GTA is 28.7. It's 48.75 on the TTC. Next slide. But if you are lucky enough to be considered poor enough to qualify the, for the Toronto Fair Pass Transit Discount Program, next slide, that number of trips to break even goes up to 59 trips. 
double the provincial average and 10 more trips than is, that is required for those that are considered only merely mildly poor to break even. Next slide. Unless the TTC and this board is prepared to right size the price for monthly pass, fair evasion will continue to fester. Thank you. Well, Alan, any questions for Alan? Okay, so I've got Commissioner Jagio. Do you want to go first? Sure. Thank you, Chair Robinson. And uh, Alan, I, I appreciate you uh, giving me some context on, on, on who you are, where you come from, and, and the visual. Just a, just a quick question for you um, around the discounted fare passes. In, in, in your opinion, and something tells me this is not the first time that you've given a presentation at a board meeting, um, and probably won't be your last time, but curious to get your thoughts on what does a right-sized fare pass look like in your mind? Well, like I said before, the provincial average is 28 trips to break even. That's when you take the number of discounted fares divided into the price of the Metro Pass. Uh, federally, like countrywide, it's about 30, 33. I think 35 is okay. Because once you see value in the Metro Pass, you want to keep using it. Because right now, if your Presto card doesn't tap, you just keep going, you get left on the ride because the presser card isn't reader, reading the, your card, you continue that trip for free. No one goes down to the subway, comes up from the subway platform to re-tap the card to get on the bus. So we've lost that ride. Once you have that Metro Pass, you have a month's worth of rides guaranteed. Excellent, thank you very much. Question for you from Commissioner Carroll. Well, I think I think, uh, uh, Madam Chair, that that Alan really he really just answered my question. Uh, but I know that Alan talks to to a lot of riders. So, so what you're saying is, once you've decided you're just going to pay individually, you're just going to pay fare by fare. Then, if there's any presto, presto inconsistency, if there's a presto failure, you're just going to take the free ride that the that the presto failure might give you a broken paddle gate or the tap doesn't work. You're not going to say, oh, excuse me, you didn't take my money here. So we're unintentional fair evasion over time becomes almost intentional um, versus yep. that person. If they work every day, probably would have just purchased a Metro pass. Well, by buying it through every day for the Metro pass, you're not getting value right now at 48 trips. So if I miss that tap, most people just keep on going. So that's your free ride that's been given away. And we right. lost that money. And I want you to, I want to thank you for, for focusing on uh, us on, on some of the things that lead to fare evasion, because this report then looks at how we, how we choose to, to uh, address each rider who might engage in fare evasion. And, and I think you've, you've, you've asked us to focus on a different kind of, uh, uh, fair evader than what we might think the turnstile jumper you're talking about about uh, a different sort of user uh, and 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 I and I think that's a good focus to ask us to take thank you thank you Alan uh, we're gonna now move over to uh, the CEO Rick Leary to introduce um, some of the partners involved in this report the writing of this report Okay, thank you very much, Chair, and uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, in, in a few minutes, Dr. Akwazi Ousubampa and Dr. Scott Wortley will walk us through their findings of the phase one of the racial equity impact assessment before you today. You will also hear from our Chief Diversity and Cultural Officer, Keisha Campbell, and other staff, staff members. We're going to talk about the steps we already have underway to address some of the report's findings, but more importantly, our plans going forward. By now you've read the report, and uh, like myself, you've probably found this uh, somewhat concerning. You've probably heard me speak before about the need of cultural change here at the TTC when it comes to diversity, equity, and inclusion. And you've also heard me say that we cannot make meaningful or lasting improvements without the insight and information to back it up. And I tell you that that's why we have the doctors doing this analysis for us. You know, we have had reports from the city's ombudsman and auditor general that have captured specific incidents or moments in time. But what you have before you today is what I consider a deeper dive into what we need to root out and address bias in all forms here at the TTC. 
Now, the professors are also looking into our approach on data collection and use uh, and ensuring the special constables and fair inspectors have the tools and training that they need to do their job in a more inclusive way. And uh, our work with the professors is ongoing and uh, it'll be complete after the second phase of the assessment, which of that phase will include consultation and engagement with racialized communities, which really is an essential part of this work. Now, early next year, we will present to you the results of those consultations, as well as a plan of action that will make us a leader, not just amongst transit systems, but amongst city agencies, boards, and commissions as well. You know, and this assessment represents an, an opportunity for us to help build a transit system that really makes people feel welcome and safe, regardless of what they look like or where they come from. You know, the good news is that we've already uh, really started making some of the necessary changes and our staff are going to walk through that here this morning. So what I'm going to do now is turn it over to the professors, uh, followed by Keisha and staff uh, for the follow up presentation. So thank you, Chair. Uh, over to you, doctors. Rick, thank you for the introduction. And uh, when we get into our slides, you'll understand why I wanted to go before Mr. Ewell. Uh, we certainly don't have that visual as if we did, my students would probably pay attention in my classes. But uh, all kidding aside, thank you very much again for the opportunity to be here with you and present the findings of our interim report. Um, we understand you know, the gravity of the task we've been um, given and um, the impact that this may potentially have on the commission itself and the ridership, so thank you. Professor Wortley and I are gonna provide an overview of the main components and main findings of our report. If we could please move to the next slide. This will include the analysis and further analysis of the historical enforcement data, um, the findings of our focus groups with uh, TTC enforcement oriented staff, and then uh, several areas of uh, policy and practice that we've been asked to um, review and, and provide uh, input and guidance on, namely the exercise of discretion and decision-making um, in relation to body cameras and on race-based data collection. Uh, we'll then provide the um, an outline of the uh, areas that we'll be addressing uh, in the second uh, phase of our work. I can uh, hand this over now to Professor Wortley. Thanks, Kwasi. Um, I want to start by uh, uh, thanking everyone for the opportunity to actually put on a tie and jacket for the first time in a year. Um, it's been uh, a long time since uh, uh, um, we presented in front of a, um, a group like this. Um, I want to stress that you know I'm going to talk about the, our analysis of the historical um, enforcement data right now. Um, there's a lot more detail. This is a higher level overview. Um, you know, please, uh, uh, there's a lot of methodological detail that is provided in the report itself. Um, and uh, uh, next slide, please. Um, we collected, uh, the, the data that we analyzed um, was data that had previously been handed over to the Toronto Star with additional fields uh, and variables for analysis. Um, it, consists, it consists of enforcement uh, data from 2008. Uh, to the end of 2018, an 11-year period. Should stress that this does not include uh, serious criminal offenses um, that are also dealt with by the TPS. Uh, in all, we uh, received data on 121,816 enforcement-related incidents. Um, these include both formal cautions and charges issued by both TTC fare inspectors and special constables. About a third of the data, or 29% of the data, uh, over 35,000 cases, had missing racial data. These were incidents where um, the race of the civilian involved was not recorded by the enforcement staff. Um, therefore, the focus of our analysis um, in, in, in the report and today uh, is uh, on the 86,810 incidents in which uh, race was identified. Next, please. We're going to focus on three uh, major uh, research questions, and we are continuing our analysis of this data and, and uh, additional data. Um, but the, th the three things that we focused on for this report was the ex extent to which racial disparities exist with respect to TTC enforcement activities. Do racial disparities vary with the use of different population benchmarking techniques? And do racial disparities persist, persist after controlling for contextual variables, including gender, type of offense, and the location? of the offense. Next, please. Um, there's a lot of numbers in this, the, uh, this, this table, uh, but I, I'd like you for the purposes of our discussion today to focus on the last two columns, the odds ratio and enforcement rate. 
Odds ratios compare the proportion of a, a particular great racial group in the enforcement data with their proportion in the benchmark population. In this case, we're looking at uh, Toronto Census data. Benchmarks around one indicate that a group is about equally uh, represented um, uh, in the enforcement data as they are in the general population. Uh, odds ratios of less than one indicate that a group is underrepresented um, with respect to their proportion of the population. And, in for, and odds ratios of uh, um, greater than one indicate uh, a group is overrepresented. Over um, for the purposes of our analysis, we use a 1.5 um, threshold to Id identify significant overrepresentation um, in the data. This is a, a high threshold, higher than uh, some other studies that exist that often use a 1.25 odds ratio. Um, but using that ratio, we can look here and, and identify that both Black and Indigenous um, individuals are uh, grossly overrepresented um, in TTC enforcement data. Uh, the next the next uh, column over is an enforcement rate. The calculation of that rate is provided in the report. But this allows us to compare how frequently different groups are involved in enforcement activities compared to other groups. So for instance, using the um, enforcement rate for Indigenous people, we can accurately state that Indigenous people are about four times more likely to be involved in enforcement incidents than their white counterparts, and that Black individuals are over twice as likely to be involved um, in enforcement incidents. Next, please. Now, um, one of the, th the the previous table was looking at just general benchmarking on the general population. One of the um, issues that we wanted to address was the fact that unique individuals from a particular racial group can drive up the numbers um, for the, the racial group overall. So individuals who are involved in dozens or hundreds sometimes um, uh, enforcement incidents uh, may have a, um, a disparate impact on the overall uh, rates for a particular group. So what we were able to do is identify unique individuals by matching their name, uh, gender, and birth date. Uh, and when we control for that, so these are recalculating these benchmarks, counting individuals only once. I should say that there were uh, uh, big differences with respect to the average number of individuals uh, um, uh, stopped in the data. Uh, indigenous people, for example, were stopped at about 3.3 uh, times, the average Indigenous person during this period compared to a less than 1.5 for white individuals. But when we recalculate this, there's uh, um, uh, sorry, uh, some important issues that, that, that emerge. Um, first of all, what we see is that the odds ratio for the indigenous population dropped from 3.75 when we use general benchmarking down to 1.5, which is significant. But what it tells us is that a lot of the overrepresentation of indigenous people in the TTC enforcement data were driven by a few unique in individuals who had been stopped on multiple occasions. That does not, however, explain the overrepresentation of black people. The odds ratio barely moves um, when we control for unique individuals. I should also note now that the uh, black uh, enforcement rate um, is higher than the indigenous enforcement rate, um, which is higher than the white rate. And the white rate is significantly higher than the rate for all other uh, racial groups, which are significantly underrepresented in the data. Next, please. Um, what we've done here is we were also able to control for people who lived outside of uh, the city of Toronto. So we wanted to do just uh, benchmarking with respect to Toronto residents alone, and not only uh, and not including individuals who might be coming from um, uh, commuters from the broader GTA or individuals who might be visiting the city as a tourist, uh, uh, etc. And what we found again is that these racial disparities. Um, still persist when we uh, control for Toronto residents. The, uh, they do not diminish uh, to any significant extent. Um, these are the uh, broken down by gender, however, and we can show that it's primarily Black and Indigenous uh, males uh, that are responsible for the overrepresentation um, in the enforcement data. Uh, black females, by uh, contrast, for instance, are about equally represented in the TTC enforcement data compared to the proportion of the Toronto population. However, I should note that black females uh, enforcement rate is significantly higher than the rates for all other uh, um, women from different racial groups, uh, higher than it is for um, um, white women, for example, and all other uh, racialized women. In fact, what we did find is that the uh, rate for black females is actually higher than 
are racialized males from other communities. Um, so there are, you know, although uh, we've got to focus on gender, um, important racial differences exist when we uh, analyze the female population in isolation. Next, please. One of the things that we, we wanted to stress was um, that we noticed the quality of the racial data declined significantly over this 11 year period. Um, in 2008 and 2009, for instance, it was quite low, uh, less than 15% um, of all enforcement incidents had missing racial data. It rises dramatically and reaches a peak of where almost half the cases in 2016 did not have um, racial data. Um, and it drops down again to about uh, 28% by 2018. Um, we can talk about, you know, maybe in the question and answer period, uh, 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 some of the reasons for this dramatic increase in missing data. Next slide, please. What this, uh, uh, um, at the same time, if we look at the trend data, we see that the overrepresentation of Black and Indigenous people has declined dramatically in the data over time. Um, what we see, is, for example, the blue line is the Indigenous individuals. Um, you know, in 2009, there were six times more overrepresented in the enforcement data than the representation um, in the population. Uh, by 2018, they're actually significantly underrepresented. The odds ratio is actually less than one. When we're looking at black individuals, uh, their highest overrepresentation was in 2008, um, when they were three times more likely to appear in the enforcement data than, the, uh, than their presence in the population. This drops to 1.76, still highly significant in 2018 but a distinct decline. Um, I, I want to caution that this should not necessarily be considered a good news story um, because this is at the same time that we saw this dramatic rise in missing data. So we strongly believe that this drop in racial disparities over time is likely due to a decrease in the quality of the racial data that was collected by the TTC during this period. Next, please. Um, a few other things that we wanted to look at. These were the major offense categories that were documented in the data. As I, as I note, these do not include serious criminal activity. Um, what we find here is that black individuals are overrepresented in all offense categories. The two largest uh, offense categories that account for most of the cases, by the way, are public order offenses um, in violation of posted regulation. And you can see that black individuals are twice, uh, you know, two times more likely to appear in these offense categories, as in all other offense categories, than the representation in the population. By contrast, we find that Indigenous individuals are not overrepresented with respect to fair violations or violation of posted regulations, but are significantly overrepresented in all other categories, including alcohol related offenses, public order offenses, um, and illegal solicitation. Once again, all other racial, racialized uh, uh, groups are significantly underrepresented uh, regardless of the um, uh, the violation that we're examining. Next, please. We also wanted to look and to see how racial disparities varied um, with respect to the location of the incident. Um, I wanted to note just with this slide that a very high proportion of all the violations uh, recorded in this historical data took place at Spadina Station. This is where um, a lot of the initial uh, fare uh, evasion uh, offenses were onboarded when, um, you know, the fair inspectors came online. Um, so this is uh, uh, just something to note. Next, please. Once again, what we find is that black individuals are significantly overrepresented regardless of the location that we examine. Um, you know, they're, they're more overrepresented at some sites like Scarborough Center than others, but their, their odds ratios um, are above 1.5 at every station that uh, was included in the data. Indigenous individuals, however, um, are more highly overrepresented in stations, uh, uh, particularly subway stations in the downtown core. And as you move away from the downtown core, that representation drops. And in fact, they are underrepresented on a number of uh, um, different uh, locations, particularly as we move out into the suburbs. Next, please. Uh, just a, a brief data summary, uh, Black and Indigenous people, uh, according to our uh, preliminary analysis, are grossly overrepresented in TTC enforcement incidents uh, that took place during this 11-year period. Black and Indigenous people are overrepresented in both charges and cautions. The overrepresentation of Black and Indigenous males is particularly pronounced. Racial disparities remain significant regardless of the benchmarking techniques employed. 
disparities remain strong if we use general population or commuting benchmarks. Um, one thing that we did not uh, present uh, uh, today, um, we used census uh, uh, data estimates for uh, the commuting population um, that uses the uh, public transit to get to work. Using that benchmark, um, racial disparities actually uh, strengthened um, rather than uh, um, became reduced. Uh, racial disparities cannot be explained by individuals who have been involved in multiple enforcement incidents, nor the presence of individuals who reside outside the city of Toronto. Racial disparities exist across all major offense categories, particularly for black uh, commuters. Black and indigenous people are overrepresented in enforcement incidents across a wide range of TTC routes, locations, and stations. Although racial disparities appear to have declined somewhat over the 11 year study period, this decline has been accompanied by an increase in missing racial data and therefore should be uh, considered with caution. Um, in our conclusion, you know, we uh, have a discussion about what are the, uh, the drivers behind these uh, 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 gross racial disparities. You know, uh, typically when Akwazi and I have done this work in the past, there's two politically polarized positions. Uh, you know, one on the right, which would say that uh, any racial disparities are due to uh, racial differences in, in offending behavior. And on the left, that all of this uh, uh, racial disparities have to do with uh, bias or discrimination within the system. Um, we believe that uh, uh, the size of the uh, disparities, um, you know, indicate that we cannot at all dismiss uh, uh, racial disparities. We personally think that that, that maybe both uh, factors are uh, um, help explain these racial disparities. Um, and in fact, previous research has shown that, you know, even slight racial differences in offending can be used to justify or reinforce practices that entrench uh, systemic discrimination within a system. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about this uh, uh, when we look at the, the views of the focus group participants and I'll turn the mic over to we'll cause it. Thank you for that, Scott. So uh, if we can move to the next slide, please. As part of our work, we also held a series of focus groups with uh, TTC enforcement staff, members of the then Transit Enforcement Unit, um, to understand uh, the nature of their work uh, and, importantly, how they go about collecting data, um, what the data is used for, and how, uh, from their perspectives, they would explain the overrepresentation of Black and Indigenous people in that data to help us, uh, you know, inquire as to the uh, reasons for the overrepresentation, as uh, Scott has just mentioned. You can see here that we held focus groups in late 2019 with uh, both then the transit special constables, as well as fare inspectors, uh, supervisors of um, the then transit enforcement unit, as well as the data managers and specialists, so the people who use the data that's been collected. If we can go to the next slide, please. We um, identified a number of uh, ways in which the data uh, were used either by those uh, on the ground uh, in enforcement capacities and um, by those, uh, the managers and uh, the supervisors and specialists. So for both fair inspectors and especially for the special constables, the data collected, the enforcement data may be used in access to check uh, evasion history and inform decision making. So uh, to the extent possible, and, and we do note some difficulties in accessing the database in the field. But um, fair inspectors and special constables may access the historical records to determine whether a rider who they've come into contact with who cannot provide proof of payment is a serial fare evader, uh, has evaded fare in the past, or uh, has not, and uh, therefore to influence how they deal with that individual. Um, especially on the special constable side, uh, the uh, data may be accessed to confirm the identity of an individual and to the extent possible conduct a background check, uh, again, to see if they've been engaged in fair evasion or other uh, law or bylaw violating behavior and potentially pose uh, some kind of risk uh, to the officer in question. To confirm um, identity for court proceedings. So we heard, especially from the special constable side, that uh, they'd collect information and, and racial descriptors in order to uh, have uh, adequate information to describe uh, the characteristics, characteristics pardon me, of an individual, if necessary, uh, in court to confirm their identity. In terms of administrative uses, uh, we did hear that um, the uh, historical enforcement data may be used to inform or it had been used previously to inform deployment practices. So um, geographical regions or specific stations or routes that had high rates of uh, fare evasion, for example, uh, may have greater resources deployed there. 
And I think it's important as well uh, for us to kind of note and address uh, the issue around the 208 cards. The um, data collection tool or the, the form that was used was uh, a form that mirrored the 208 cards that and had been adapted uh, from the, the, the data collection tools used by the Toronto Police Service that were deemed controversial in the context of the practice of carding. We questioned um, staff members about uh, both the, the data collection tool, but also about their data collection practices. And what we heard was that although they were using the 208 card, that 208 card was used as a primary means of collecting information about people who had been caught in violation of um, some bylaw. Uh, it was not used, uh, at least in the main, as a uh, tool to collect information on randomly stopped uh, riders. I think it's important that we also note, given the historical relationship between the TTC Enforcement Unit and the Toronto Police Service, that for a period of time uh, through our inquiry, we're uh, believing that it was up until about 2013, so in the time frame uh, for which our uh, quantitative data represent, that this information was being shared with the Toronto Police Service. If we can go on to the next slide, please. We wanted to understand from the perspective of the uh, individuals who collect uh, and to an extent use the data, uh, how they would explain the overrepresentation of Black and Indigenous people in that data and what impact that it had on the work that they do. I think it's important for us to note as well um, that we heard very clearly and we can see this in the data that staff members had not been given any uh, kind of formal training or direction on how to collect race-based uh, data. Uh, there was a lot of inconsistency with respect to the uh, racial classifications that were used to describe people who would be, uh, from a social scientific standpoint, classified as members of the same racial group. Uh, when asked to explain uh, the overrepresentation, we heard a range of responses, uh, ranging from outright denials of, of racism or discrimination. Uh, we heard oftentimes that the enforcement unit then was uh, made up of uh, a diverse uh, background of, of staff, people from diverse backgrounds. It was perhaps the most racially diverse unit within the TTC, according to some participants. And as a result, it was unlikely that uh, racial bias would um, be a, a cause of the disparities that we noted. We did uh, hear from uh, some participants that they believe that they enforce um, fair policy and other policies equally and that unequal offending uh, may be to, to blame here. And we heard a, a range of reasons why uh, members of different racial groups may engage in fair and other uh, policy violating behavior. Some of these related to issues of mental health and mental illness, uh, issues of, of poverty and marginalization, which we know, and as we heard from staff, are, are not equal across different racial groups in our city. The uh, staff did um, tell us about the impact that this has had on them and the work that they do. Uh, there was concern that they'd been labeled uh, and accused of, uh, labeled as racist and, and accused of racism, uh, that this, is impact, this had impacted for periods of time uh, their willingness to engage in, for example, fair inspection activity, specifically when involving members of certain racial groups. So we acknowledge some deep policing here, uh, some concern that they would not uh, have the, the support of the TTC if they were to receive complaints from racialized riders about uh, their fair inspection and other enforcement activities. And so they noted both a series of both professional and personal consequences, including, um, as we heard from some staff, uh, an impact on their uh, mental health. If we could uh, move on, please. We asked uh, for suggestions from staff. We uh, Two main areas in which the suggestions for improvement came, one related to technology and the other training. Uh, staff felt that improved uh, and, and, and more reliable technology, including the uh, proof of payment or tap systems on the streetcars, which we heard uh, often malfunction. Uh, if those were working, there would be less uncertainty about whether or not riders had paid their fares. Uh, they also called in and, and uh, were interested in body cameras, which we'll address shortly, but as a way of uh, providing uh, more objective um, or a, a, a different view information on interactions that they have with riders. And then there was support for um, racial awareness and, and, and racial sensitivity training for uh, staff. So that's the end of the focus groups. The, the next area that we were asked to look at, and we can move on, was around decision-making and discretion. Now, in any enforcement-oriented uh, environment, um, individuals responsible for enforcing law and policy are typically afforded a fair amount of discretion. 
What that means is that they are allowed to choose from a range of options in deciding how to deal with an individual that they come into contact with who has violated a policy or a law. Um, now, discretion is desirable for a number of reasons. It's impossible, for example, for supervisors to constantly supervise staff. Uh, there are a number of reasons why um, one may not want to, or an institution, an agency, and a society may not want to enforce law or policy to the full effect. And if we think about the policing realm, every day in this country, the police come across people who have broken the law, and they do not enforce the law to their full uh, potential or, or, or capabilities. And the same is true within the transit system. Now, there are, of course, though, a number of problematic aspects of uh, discretion, uh, and namely for the purposes of, of our work, the potential for differential enforcement. So anytime there's the ability to choose from a range of options when confronted with uh, an individual or a member of a specific group, there's always the potential that that individual may be treated differently because of their characteristics. And we know that uh, race and socioeconomic status in other um, instances and in other environments do influence decision-making uh, in enforcement actions. If you could move on, please. Next slide, thank you very much. So we reviewed uh, both policy um, materials and, and training materials around decision-making and discretion within the TTC and identified um, key areas of, of or key decision-making points for both the special constables and for the fair inspectors. And these are, of course, in relation to proof of payment activities. So initiating proof of payment activities and how to proceed when um, confronted with a, a rider who cannot provide proof of payment, as well as in relation to other enforcement actions. We can uh, move on as well. We can see the key points uh, for the fair inspectors, obviously much more and now revenue protection, much more related to proof of payment. Whereas for the, the special constables, uh, there's much more of a range. Now, what we uh, have uh, determined, what we've seen is that there is a, a fair level of uh, direction uh, and, and written policy around the more consequential or seemingly more consequential, but less common forms of, of decision-making with respect to enforcement. So here specifically thinking about um, initiating an arrest, proceeding with an arrest, and especially around use of force. And what we've also found is that there's much less direction given um, written and, and in at least what we can see from the training, and I must note that we did not observe the training, we reviewed the training materials, uh, but there's much less uh, direction given for the much more common um, forms of decision making, specifically around uh, proof of payment activities. And so we have recommended, if you could please move on, that the TTC develop uh, a strong um, discretion policy uh, that this discretion policy um, align with the the value and values and goals of the broader TTC of the TTC itself, and I'm thinking here specifically around um, fair and equitable uh, service provided to customers. If we can move on uh, as well to one more slide, please. Importantly, we've um, and you can see this on the second point here. Uh, advise the TTC to strongly consider removing the verbal warning option that staff have when confronted with a uh, rider who has violated especially fair policy, but potentially in other areas. As it stood at the time uh, that we undertook uh, this part of our review, when confronted with a rider, for example, who could not provide proof of payment, uh, staff had three uh, options or three main options with which they could proceed. They could give the individual a verbal warning and let them on their way, leaving no paper trail. They could give them a formal caution, which would be noted and documented, and we've seen that in the data that uh, Professor Wortley has presented, and then they could ticket them. Now, the problem is uh, with the first option, the verbal warning, there's no paper trail. And if the TTC is uh, committed to ensuring fair and equitable uh, service and to identifying racial disparities and potential racial discrimination, then it needs to be able to account for the decision-making actions of its staff. And that verbal warning option does not allow for that. And so, again, we've suggested seriously considering removing that verbal warning option and proceeding with a, a, a documented caution or a ticket. And I think it's important to note, and we did so in the report, that that uh, written uh, or that formal caution option, just because an individual has been formally cautioned before, does not mean that they couldn't receive another caution. Uh, in fact, we would suggest including that in the policy, but that the policy state that any um, enforcement oriented action be documented by staff. Thank you. I'll pass it back over to Scott to discuss body cameras. Thanks, Akwasi. Uh, next slide, please. 
Um, one of the, the, the tasks that we were um, given was to uh, provide a synthesis of the uh, evaluation literature to date on uh, body-worn cameras within uh, law enforcement. Um, I should stress from the beginning that this research is just in its infancy. Um, there, uh, um, the technology has been adopted by a broad range of police services and uh, um, transit enforcement units over the last uh, four or five years. Um, a lot of the evaluation has not been necessarily of high quality. Um, and uh, we want to stress that, uh, you know, these are preliminary findings that need to be explored further through uh, continued research efforts. Um, there have been, however, some potential benefits that have been identified um, through the evaluation literature. You know, first and foremost being um, that body-worn cameras can provide what has been called a civilizing effect on both officers and civilians. Uh, that officers uh, have been found to, uh, you know, speak more uh, politely uh, respectfully to, to civilians when they know that the body cameras are on, um, uh, uh, conduct themselves in a more professional manner. Um, and likewise, that civilians, once they know they're being filmed, uh, um, act uh, more respectfully towards enforcement officers, uh, that their demeanor improves, and that this uh, could go a long way towards, uh, um, you know, uh, preventing the escalation of incidents. Um, some studies have found that uh, body cameras have contributed to fewer formal complaints being lodged against in enforcement agencies. Others have noted uh, decreased use of uh, formal uh, use of force uh, cases or incidents. Um, importantly, uh, a growing number of studies have found that uh, the body camera footage itself can be used as a form of evidence collection um, and as a, as a result have created court-related cost savings. Um, that individuals, for instance, uh, um, an, uh, an alleged offender confronted with body camera image um, may plead guilty early in the, the, the justice stage rather than proceed with an expensive trial. Um, clearly, body, uh, one, you know, one of the greatest benefits uh, uh, proposed with respect to body cameras are that they provide improved transparency and greater police accountability. And indeed, you know, we, we have shown that at least in principle, the general public, public is uh, quite supportive of uh, law enforcement um, adopting this form of technology um, with the belief that it will improve uh, professionalism, reduce corruption, um, reduce unprofessional behavior, and increase trust, community trust in the police. Next, please. There are, however, some limitations. Um, these limitations include um, <clears throat> Uh, um, the fact that the research findings have been inconsistent. Some findings, for instance, have shown declines in uh, use of force incidents and complaints. Other studies have found no change. Uh, a few have even found that uh, things have gotten worse. So the, the findings uh, to date have not uh, provided a clear picture. Um, a lot has been uh, uh, documented with respect to the high cost um, of the technology with respect to its purchase, maintenance, and data storage. Um, this has uh, particularly become an issue since the emergence of the defund the police uh, or detask the police movement. Um, a big issue, uh, again, returning to what Akwazi was talking about previously, was the issue of discretion. Many services allow their officers to turn on and off the cameras. Um, this has led to uh, a number of high profile incidents uh, involving allegations of uh, uh, everything from police brutality to unprofessional conduct. Um, where it's uh, been disclosed that the officers had turned off their, their cameras, and that can create a crisis in confidence with respect to law enforcement. Um, even when cameras are on, there's often missing footage uh, created by blind spots, um, or, or you know, particularly problematic is when uh, civilian and uh, uh, law enforcement agencies are very close, um, where you really can't see through the, uh, uh, the body camera footage what is happening. Um, officer and civilian privacy issues um, have emerged as a, a, a growing legal issue. Um, one of the more controversial issues is civilian access to video footage. Many civilians assume that if uh, they are being filmed by law enforcement, they would have immediate access to any body camera footage that is produced. Um, that does not pan out in practice. Many uh, law enforcement agencies um, do not release uh, the, the, the footage to civilians or their legal representation. Um, until public pressure has been uh, mounted. Uh, case in point would be, you know, the George Floyd case where 
uh, body camera footage was not released for uh, several months um, after the incident and only because of uh, um, public demands for its release. Um, clearly, one of the biggest issues is that problems with technology could undermine public confidence um, with respect to uh, um, law enforcement and, and, and a backfire with respect to increasing police legitimacy. There are a number of other uses. One of the things that we've talked about and are considering is the use of uh, body cameras to, uh, uh, as reliability checks uh, to test for the quality of race-based data that is being collected um, by officers in the field. You know, a random sample of, of footage could be compared with official records to see uh, the correspondence rate. But um, we'll be ta talking about that more in the final report. A question? Thank you. And on the race-based data, if we could please move to the next slide. Uh, so one of the other areas that we've been asked to address is the collection of race-based data um, within TTC enforcement to actions uh, in order to ensure fair and equitable service, such data must be collected. Uh, we've recommended that the TTC examine the uh, race-based data policy recently devised by the Toronto Police Service Board. Uh, this um, policy, we believe, is, is comprehensive um, and uh, has been conducted both uh, with ex extensive uh, kind of background research, but also community consultation. Uh, given that the Transit Special Constables or the Special Constable uh, Service has uh, some of its powers afforded to it uh, by the Toronto Police Service Board, it makes sense to align those policies. Uh, we do want to note, though, however, we see a couple of key weaknesses with the TPSB policy, namely exactly how the data are collected and how uh, that data may be used to evaluate uh, staff performance. Um, so in the report, we've uh, recommended uh, the collection of such data. Um, but pending further review and importantly, community consultation, because communities must be provided the opportunity to provide their insight and input with respect to uh, the collection of information about them. We can move on to the next slide, please. Uh, so as outlined uh, at the end of our report, uh, and noting that this is you know, just the presentation of our interim results, we have um, perhaps more work uh, ahead of us than, than we've completed to date. In terms of next steps, we're going to conduct a review of how other transit agencies have approached and dealt with issues related to race and racism. Uh, conducting further analysis of TTC enforcement data, including uh, different ways in which we can benchmark to identify the population actually using the transit system, something we planned on doing before the pandemic hit, but obviously had to pull back on. Looking at criminal incidents, use of force incidents and race-based complaints involving enforcement staff. And then we're holding uh, a, a wide range of consultations with uh, leaders and stakeholders from affected communities, uh, consultations with TTC executives, as well as members of the public. Uh, we've just completed our survey of uh, TTC special constables and fare inspectors, which uh, resulted in a high response rate and, and what, from what we can tell thus far, good quality data. And so thank you again for the staff for participating in that. Uh, we hope to conduct a survey of TTC consumers and then present our final report and recommendations to the TTC and the board. Thank you. Scott, any last? Uh, well, one thing to, to add is um, both Kwasi and I have been uh, really impressed with uh, how open and candid and cooperative, um, you know, uh, the, the TTC and particularly the enforcement units, uh, the fair the inspectors and uh, Special constable units have been in terms of forwarding and uh, enabling this research. It's compared to some other more contentious uh, inquiries we've been involved in. It's been um, a pleasant uh, uh, surprise with respect to um, uh, how committed uh, uh, the TTC staff that we're working with have been towards the project. And that that includes the enforcement staff. We certainly wouldn't uh, have the understanding of what they do and how the data is used without the openness of the enforcement oriented staff. So again, we commend them for working with us on this. Oh my God. Hi, okay, thank you very much. That was an excellent presentation. We really appreciate all your uh, research and time and commitment to this. Uh, there is some questions for you, and uh, I'll just remind the commissioners that you have five minutes for questions. You can direct them to the, the good doctors or to TTC staff. And the first person, person up for questions is Commissioner Lalonde. So if you could go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair, and, uh, and thank you to the doctors for this work, and it was an excellent presentation. 
I have two questions. The first is you indicated that the um, the data in the later years that uh, that seemed to indicate maybe some moderation in the in the statistics. Um, should be viewed with caution because the the quantity of data with with racial information was going down. I'm curious if your your work with the um, with the special constables uh, gave you any insight into why there was less data during those periods and and whether you have any hypothesis as to uh, any bias that might be in in that change. Yeah, um, and we are. Uh have gone through a series of debriefings with the uh, the staff where we've done a similar presentation as we've done today, and we've asked that question. Um, and uh, there seems to be kind of three major hypotheses that are, that we're exploring. Um, one is that uh, about 2014 is when the fair inspectors came on board, um, and uh, uh, during that time they may have a very different kind of task, less time with uh, uh, customers than special constables. Um, and as a result, um, may not have been uh, uh, able or fully committed to uh, collecting race-based data. Um, a second hypothesis is that you know this was around the time when the data quality starts to decline is around the time when um, racial profiling was becoming a big issue with the TPS. Um, so there is a concern that there might have been kind of a, a, a withdrawal uh, or, or hesitancy uh, for TTC staff to re record that data if they thought it was going to somehow lead to allegations of racial bias. Um, and then the third is, uh, you know, at some point uh, uh, for some period, we haven't exactly figured it out yet, we're exploring that, there may have been kind of a decision not to collect the data anymore, like a formal uh, um, decision that for at least a, uh, for a time period not to collect this data anymore. And all three may have contributed to um, that decline. But it is something that we want to examine and it definitely is something that we'll be considering in our recommendations moving forward. Uh, your, uh, your mic's off. <laughs> my, uh, thank you for that answer. My, my second question is, did you consider um, or did you do any analysis of the data by officer to, and I'm not looking to, you know, to, to name and shame or anything like that, but I'm, I'm curious is there whether there's significant dispersion by officer in the data? We are um, examining that data now. Uh, it was an additional request. Uh, it took a while to de-identify the data and just include kind of officer numbers that would not violate any privacy. Uh, I can say that yes, um, there are uh, significant variations um, according to officers. Uh, um, this is referred to as uh, what's referred to as internal benchmarking identify officers who are outliers or have a pattern of enforcement that is significantly different than their peers. So it's not only comparing it to, um, you know, some kind of uh, census benchmark, but also comparing it to um, how their peers were doing like, uh, like work. Um, we will be including that uh, in future analyses, um, but also seeing if there's explanations for that, because we've got to consider, for instance, um, what locations officers are working at. You know, so if somebody is working at a particular location, um, racial disparities with respect to their personal record might be due to where they're working as opposed to, um, you know, any kind of uh, uh, bias on their part. So we, we will be doing a careful analysis of that. Okay, thank you very much. So those are my questions, Madam Chair. Commissioner Lalonde, and uh, I've just been uh, advised that the staff, TTC staff, would like to make a short presentation. So we're going to segue back to that, but there is a number of commissioners with questions, so stand by. Uh, if the doctors could stand by, and I'll throw it over back over to TTC staff. Good morning, everybody. Um, in the next few slides, we're going to be sharing some of the work underway at the TTC, our path forward to build greater diversity and inclusion, and also as we move forward on the work by Dr. Owusu Bampa and Dr. Scott Wortley. So next slide, please. So TTC is committed to becoming a leader in diversity and inclusion. In December 2020, the TTC committed to a 10-point action plan to build greater diversity and inclusion at the TTC. We've also committed to a system-wide anti-racism strategy and adopted the Toronto Action Plan to confront anti-Black racism. 
The phase one racial equity impact assessment supports the TTC's commitment to identify and address any racial inequities in employment and the delivery of services to TTC customers through the collection analysis and reporting of disaggregated race-based data. Customer and employee consultation and engagement is critical to systemic change at the TTC and also the phase two work by Dr. Wortley and Uwu Subampa. And we are working with them to ensure the voices of Black, Indigenous and racialized community members are included in ongoing work at the TTC. The TTC is also working to review policies and practices, including employment policies and practices with an anti-Black racism lens in addition to TTC's existing diversity and inclusion lens and toolkit. And finally, with respect to training, confronting anti-Black racism training continues to be rolled out across the organization. And priority groups, such as the entire Revenue Protection Department and Special Constable Services Departments, have completed this training. All supervisors at the TTC will have received this training by July of 2021, and then this training will be rolled out to all staff and unionized employees. Additional anti-racism and anti-Indigenous racism training is also planned to be rolled out later this year. I will now pass it over to Michelle Jones to speak about work underway in Revenue Protection and Special Constables. Good morning, everyone. Uh, so in response to the Racial Equity Impact Assessment, we're taking an opportunity to uh, introduce you to our Revenue Protection and Special Constable Service a culture change framework. In order to affect change um, internally and externally in these two departments, we have to take a holistic approach, and that is we're examining and addressing the people, the processes, the technology, and the supporting training. Our objective is to provide a safety, security, and revenue protection service that are customer focused and founded in respect and dignity. Our framework has four key pillars, and that is a structure for success, um, modernize policies, procedures, uh, standards, and programs, update our technologies, and overhaul our training and monitoring systems. The next two slides will speak to actions directly related to the recommendations contained in this racial equity impact assessment report. Can we have the next slide, please? Thank you. So as described in the February 2020 uh, TDC board report on TDC's revenue protection strategy, um, we had a reorganization of the transit enforcement unit in early 2020 to address the most important and urgent issue facing the unit. And that's changing the culture of the departments while enhancing our focus on key priorities of transit safety and maximizing revenue protection. Then in July of 2020, the Revenue Protection and Special Constable Services um, departments moved from the operations group to the strategy and customer experience group. This further signals the commitment uh, of TDC of putting the customer first um, at the center uh, while we modernize our service to better serve customers and the residents of TTC. These two moves directly align with the racial equity impact assessment recommendation for the TDC to identify and reaffirm the mandate goals and values of the two departments and align them with the mandate goals and values of the TDC. Um, the next uh, pillar is about modernizing policies. This pillar focuses on rewriting policies and procedures in, align in alignment with various third party reports as well as our industry peers. We've had 30 this is one of our third party reports. We've had recommendations from the Ombudsman Toronto, as well as recommendations from the Auditor General. And um, we also look to um, recommendations for our peers, such as uh, uh, racial profiling with uh, Toronto Police Service as commissioned by the Ontario Human Rights Commission. Uh, so key actions that have taken place in this pillar is that uh, prior to commissioning this uh, racial equity report, we've paused the collection of race-based data collection. And we're going to keep this paused until we go through the following steps of drafting a data collection and reporting policy. Um, we'll, con we'll conduct expert consultations, community consultations, and public consultations jointly with the professors. Then we will then look to finalize the policies and we'll develop the associated training and systems to operational the collection, operationalize the collection of 
and reporting of race-based data. In early 2020, um, the teams are also advised to have a shift in their performance expectations. That is, the fair inspection program what objective was to increase the revenue base through additional taps by reinforcing a positive customer culture, encouraging our riders and even our employees to tap every time. The, uh, this RAIA report also recommends a use of discretion policy. This policy has been drafted and is currently undergoing the consultation process. At this point, I'm going to hand this uh, the next slide over to Andrew Dixon, the head of our Special Constable Service Department. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. I'm going to talk a little bit about the update on technologies and the overhauling of training. So as far as the update of technologies, we've conducted an internal proof of concepts for the body-worn cameras and the patrol in-car cameras. We're currently in the midst of planning the pilot and full implementation, and the planning will be informed by upcoming public consultations. Our policy development and um, project planning will also be guided um, by the uh, IPC Information and Privacy Commission of Ontario and Ombudsman Toronto. With the overhauling of training um, as a proactive measure um, to support our teams before the commissioning of the RIA report, um, we developed interim training in 2019 um, on the use of discretion, recognizing bias, um, specifically the ethical decision-making and recognizing discretion, recognizing implicit and explicit bias. Um, and the outline of the two courses uh, can be found in the December 2020 streetcar incident report. Um, as noted earlier, all the teams have been trained on confronting anti-Black racism through the city of Toronto's con confronting anti-Black racism unit and support our team while in the development of policies and training, we have an interim course that we um, are using right now. We call it the reset training. So all the teams in both departments, frontline supervisory and support staff will be completing this training. Focus will understand their roles, responsibilities, aligning with TTC policies and practices, and also provide imp information on upcoming changes impacting the way we conduct our work. For example, um, effecting arrest, memo books, note taking, use of discretion, race-based data collection and reporting. This is just a quick overview of the action that we are taking to align with the recommendation from the racial equity impact assessment. As we um, progress through this framework, we are providing updates to you, the board. Um, our first sort of comprehensive report will be in June of this year, and you can refer to Appendix D in the RIA um, with the list of sort of planned reporting dates. I'll now turn it over to the Chief of Diversity and Culture Officer, Keisha Campbell. Thank you for that, Andrew. And really nice to meet everyone virtually. I look forward to meeting you in person at some point. Um, so I will wrap things up for us in terms of looking at the path forward. Um, and with all that we've discussed today, I know you're interested in that path. So when we think about the TTC's corporate plan, we know that one of our critical paths is about enabling our employees to succeed. An essential path of that part of that path focuses on the importance of embracing diversity, which as our commitment to working with the professors shows, extends to customers as well. So if we switch gears and think about the path forward for us holistically, I'd like to leave you with three key takeaways. One, for the positive change um, that we're looking for, we must reflect inward at our organization and at the commission as a whole. This work is well underway with the work we've done and the commitments we've made. And some examples of that would be our diversity and human rights strategy, our 10 point action plan, and adopting the Ombudsman of Toronto recommendations amongst um, a few others. The second, an external focus with key touch points with our writers and the public through engagement is also important. There is, the, there is a community engagement underway, as the professor shared, and just as we recommended for revenue, and revenue protection and special constables units, we will continue to work to ensure that the values and goals of the entire organization are integrated into all lines of business within the TTC. And lastly, I would say our future is one in which we will continue to be committed to building a culture that is focused on actions. And we're looking to you, the public and the board to hold us accountable to this commitment. So thank you. And with that, I will open it up to questions. Hey, thank you very much for the staff presentation. Uh, we have a list of commissioners that would like to speak. Next is commissioner, no, not speak, ask questions. 
uh, Commissioner Osborne. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I really appreciated the thorough report and had a couple questions. Um, it, at one point you mentioned that there was no, this is for the professors, there was no paper trail for verbal warnings. And I'm wondering if you have any sense or any documentation or data that there were any racial groups or genders, I guess for that matter, that were privileged in this uh, least aggressive uh, response from enforcement? Thank you for the question. Uh, we don't have a sense, and, and I think therein lies the problem. We can't know what we don't know because there is no paper trail there. And so that's why we think that that option should be removed. Because I reached out to Brad Bradford last night, and now I look like an idiot. Oh, Jay, hmm. your mic's so hot. Um, I have a second question, and um, I had... I noted the question and then we had um, a staff member, Andrew Dixon, make a comment, but I, I was wondering if um, our academics had a point of view, because you mentioned the pros and the cons on body cameras. And then Andrew Dixon from staff mentioned that we are piloting a program with a view to implementing it. So I'm assuming the answer is in the response from the TTC, but I guess I'd, I'd like to hear it from you. Um, you know, as, as we uh, said with respect to, um, you know, the, our presentation on body cameras is that any implementation needs to be closely monitored and evaluated. Um, you know, there, there needs to be kind of a cost benefit analysis uh, conducted. I mean, we don't, uh, um, we, come, we have not come up with that uh, our recommendation. I believe that was an independent TTC decision. It's generally quite uh, consistent with what the public wants. Um, but I do think that, you know, as, as academics, we've got to be cautious because the technology is still relatively, relatively new. Um, and how can we uh, address and overcome uh, some of the identified concerns that we outlined in the presentation? But I, we can't say more than that um, with respect to when and how it's going to be implemented with the, with the TTC. Uh, okay, thank you. Those are my questions. Thank you, Commissioner Osborne. Next is Commissioner Lai. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you very much for, for that comprehensive uh, interim report. And I got quite a number of good questions, I mean, uh, information from there. Um, just wanted to ask the, uh, the professors that a uh, couple of questions. Actually, you answered my question with your next step. Uh, uh, you know, all these um, next steps that you were going to do, you say you're going to be looking at how other jurisdictions are dealing with this. And I'm just wondering uh, whether you're going to be looking at just cities in, uh, in North America, are you going to be looking at other cities internationally? Um, Kwasi, do you want to take it? Or? Yeah, th thank you for that question. Uh, I think our uh, examination should be broad. Um, many people, I think, like to look south of the border to the United States for solutions. And I think, especially in enforcement environments, that's uh, an inappropriate one. So I think we'd be looking to other, I see a thumbs up there from Councillor, thank you. Uh, uh, looking to other jurisdictions as well, uh, especially other English speaking Western nations. So English speaking Western nations, you're not going to looking for those non English speaking people. Uh, <laughs> if this is something that the board thinks we should, we I'm unilingual uh, and uh, as is Professor Wortley. So it's a matter of access to information and uh, we have a lot of work ahead of us. And so there's only so much that we can do. Yeah, there might be, there might be some different uh, way of uh, tackling this in some of these non English speaking mm -hmm. uh, cities. Anyways, um, all kidding aside, as you said. What are uh, the race based data that you're going to be collecting? Uh, I, I see that there's a lot of, um, you know, incidents uh, recently on, on Asian, you know, in Asian race, um, racism. And I'm just wondering whether would this be on the radar screen that you're going to be, you know, doing in sort of like a, a different category? Um, you know, definitely we haven't looked at, um, a lot of the criminal incidents, for instance, that the, uh, uh, TTC constables deal with uh, um, and also uh, collaborate with the TPS. Um, 
you know, looking at the uh, uh, issues of victimization, we've primarily been tasked with, with looking at kind of charges that have been and tickets and warnings that have been given by TTC staff. But uh, clearly the issue of, of hate crime and hate crime incidents um, is an extension of that. And we will be looking at issues of criminal offenses and how they're documented um, and likely will be uh, um, addressed in our, our, our final recommendations with, res with respect to race-based data collection. It's an important issue. Thank you. Yeah, I'm glad that you uh, agree with that. It's an important issue. Uh, my final question, I think, is for TTC staff uh, about the uh, the fair enforcement officer or inspectors or whatever. I just wanted to uh, make sure that uh, how diverse is that team of staff that we have? Do they speak different languages? Or I, I see that our our chief um, diversity officer is, is racialized and is, is a female. I, I really am very happy to see that. But what I'm saying is just wanted to ask a question of staff whether our existing officers, fair, you know, fair enforcement officers, do we do we have different uh, diversity in there or do they speak different languages? Hi there. Um, so I'll speak to the fair inspectors. So our fair inspectors, uh, we are pretty uh, diverse. So in 2019, we were about 52.6% racially diverse. And then in 2020, we've gone up to 60%. Um, from gender diversity, we went from 16.2 to 24.2%. And we speak over 30 languages. Okay. Okay, thank you. Those are my questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, next up is Commissioner Jagdio. If you could go ahead, please. Uh, thank you, Chair Robinson, and I want to give a shout out to the professors for doing this presentation and gathering these details. Um, I, I, I could talk and discuss at length on this topic, and as somebody who, and, and, and I did the research myself and actually tabulated this in 2019, being stopped 12 times by fair officers as a working professional in the City of Toronto, I, I understand the anxiety that this induces. So I, I do truly appreciate the work being done here. And I do believe that the insights that you've driven will be instrumental in making positive change for the TTC. Um, I have two questions for you and then I have a question for staff members. Uh, my question for you is during the consultations with the, foreign, the fair enforcement officers, were you able to get any insight on where they felt the gaps were in their training? And how have we recorded that in a way that our staff members can use those insights to help discern good policy. My second question is around measuring. And I, I'm a big proponent of figuring out ways that we can measure um, any implementation of new strategies to, to better what we're trying to do here. So do, do you two have any recommendations on the best way to measure success outside of just looking at like uh, the macro statistics on, okay, well, do we see a reduction in, um, you know, racialized or biased, um, uh, stops or, or or offenses, are there ways to think through how we individually measure leadership on, on executing this? And my, my third question, which is to staff, um, relates to my first question, which is around, are we thinking about including these fair enforcement officers in the decision making, or at least in the consultation process, around some policies? Um, do you want to work, Scott? No, you, you go ahead. Sure. Uh, so uh, thank you for the questions. Um, with respect to the, the gaps in training, from the focus groups we held, certainly, and, and this was acknowledged, one was around the collection of race-based data itself, right? And so in thinking about moving forward, uh, staff need to be adequately trained and directed on how to do that specifically. Uh, we did when we asked about um, previous uh, anti-racism training, anti-discrimination training did hear that uh, some staff had received some training, specifically that provided by the uh, Confronting Anti-Black Racism Unit. We, at the time of the focus groups, that was beginning to roll out. Um, but there was certainly a sense that they could use more training. Um, and, you know, I would say, again, my perception from the conversations, even if this was less explicit, further direction with respect to the initiation of enforcement activities and the considerations to be made when engaging in those activities. 
Um, I, I'll just touch upon the measuring change and then I'll let Scott, that's very much his expertise. Uh, the stats will be important uh, and, and understanding what drives any disparities in the statistics, going back to that, is it differential offending or, or, or is it bias? But I think we certainly need to measure uh, both staff and, and importantly public perceptions uh, with respect to change here. Um, this is, you know, justice must not only be done, but must be seen to be done, right? And again, if we're looking to advance equitable service and to, to create change, then it, it must be demonstrated to the ridership that that change is ongoing. And, and I'll say, there have been huge changes since we started this work. Uh, Professor Wortley and I struggled to keep up with the pace of change internally, and we had to revise our report as we were going along because things were changing swiftly. And so uh, having that and, and, and the other, uh, the, the rest of the evolution of, of what's happening here being made public is important. I'll just uh, uh, add a, a, a few points. I think with respect to evaluation, you've got to have a multifaceted uh, uh, approach. Um, you do have to look uh, and continue to look at uh, uh, changes with respect to racial disparities in terms of enforcement outcomes. Um, not only uh, you know to determine whether or not uh, uh, you know uh, racial disparities persist and why, um, but also you know I strongly feel that uh, data collection is an accountability me mechanism. You know, when officers uh, in any capacity or, or any kind of a, a public figure knows that they've got to document, you know, the decisions that they're making, they become more conscious um, of the role that races may be playing in their own, uh, uh, own activities. Um, and it serves not only as some kind of research or evaluation mechanism, but an accountability me uh, mechanism that can change uh, activities and cultures within um, institutions. I think importantly, um, we've also got to, you know, monitor how uh, uh, riders and, and, and customers feel. You know, do they notice a change? Uh, you know, as, as, as Akwazi said, and, and Akwazi and I do a lot of work on public opinion with respect to the justice system. Um, and I think the same thing has to do, be uh, done with respect to racial differences in satisfaction on the TTC. Um, you know, is it consistent? Is it improving? Uh, um, we've got some baseline measures that we will be collecting with respect to our ongoing activities. Um, and those types of surveys need to be conducted both internally and externally to see uh, um, how any changes are impacting confidence, trust, and satisfaction, um, you know, with the, with, with the TTC. Um, you know, uh, um, it's also important. We've got valuable insights talking to uh, frontline, frontline staff and some of the concerns um, that they have. I mean, they they definitely have stories with respect to um, the challenges and difficulties and and uh, uh, verbal and physical assaults that they've faced on uh, on the job. They have a lot to be said, uh, you know, with respect to sometimes feeling handcuffed, they uh, not knowing, you know, uh, what to do. Uh, you know, some evidence of depolicing at times when they feel that they don't want to be uh, confronted with allegations of, of racism. So. And one of the uh, important findings was that sometimes the fair inspectors felt that they policed sheep so that anybody who was kind of like compliant, um, they would focus on. But now we're backing backing down from uh, harder cases and whether or not that was consistent with what they should be doing. It's a really complex issue that we that, that we have to focus on. And this is why we've tried a, a multi method approach rather than just focus on one analytical strategy. Excellent. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Next is uh, Vice Chair De Laurentiis. You're up. Uh, good morning. Um, uh, sorry, Chair. There was one question about our, our staff thinking about including the fair inspectors in decision making. I just wanted yeah. to respond to that Please. question. Sorry. So, yes, um, we have a very collaborative team and um, so one of the things that we had uh, the the professors do is conduct a survey um, with the staff, a very intense survey with our team members to collect their um, their opinions, their views. Uh, there were multiple lenses that we looked at, as well as um, we do uh, send policies through to team members, and this is the, the working drafts, and we want them to whoever wants. To Part of the the decisions and um, part of the the change, um, their voices are welcome, right? So we look for information from them as well. Um, I'm hoping that uh, when we do have these racial equity committees um, 
that will have some frontline staff as well included as part of these racial equity committees. Thank you for asking my question. Uh, thank you, Chair. I guess that uh, means I'm up. Thank you. Um, let me start by saying I think these reports uh, are so key. They're so important. And in particular, um, when we uh, look to external experts to do the analysis, I think that that allows us then to put a mirror um, up in front of us and uh, uh, get uh, unbiased information. And then as important to share that information externally so that uh, we we are able to be accountable. Um, one of the questions that that um, occurs to me, and this is really uh, to the staff, is that these reports give us uh, really amazing data um, and very in-depth data, including I noted that uh, both of our researchers um, said, you know, there's likely to be some underlying issues, and there are specific, there are individuals who are often um, picked up or picked on at the you know quite often so it's the same individual so so i'm wondering um since this gives us that kind of data whether as part of our overall program that we look at some of this underlying data and share it with um, other social agencies uh, within um uh, metro uh, to seek help for some of these individuals you know they're clearly in some cases there will be poverty issues and mental health issues. And um, and so, you know, I think this this sort of data puts us in that position where we can be more broadly helpful. Uh, so I and I realize that, you know, the initial um, set of activities need to go around uh, fixing uh, our processes and procedures and making sure that we are behaving in an in a non racialized way. Um, but I think we have the opportunity here to be um, perhaps more broadly helpful, and and so I just put that question to the to the team, to the management team, as to whether we'll be part of the the plan longer term. Yeah, I can um, answer that um, a part of it, and then Michelle can take over if I sort of leave anything out. But we do have a community engagement team. Um, one of the things that I'm looking to is increase the number of that team, so I have a budgeted team for that, right? And one of the things that they do um, with that can community engagement is work with streets to homes. And they do a real good job of finding individuals in the station. Um, we really move away from the, because streets to homes, they're that collaboration, right? So we're trying to move away from that enforcement piece to we're helping you piece, right? And and they, they do help people get off the street and into a home, right? So like they literally, <laughs> the, the, their name sort of says it all. Um, so we're looking to increase that. And we are even working with um, even with Vaughn because uh, the the you know transit does go up to Vaughn now, so we're looking to collaborate with that group of there as well. So there is a good collaboration group that's happening right now. We're working with the encampment team because of the COVID um, sort of implication with the um, encampments that are sort of growing throughout the city. So we do have a collaborative group that we're working. I'd say every two weeks we sort of meet just to see how we can strategize to work together as a team. And I'll just jump in about the data part. Um, uh, as part of the consultations uh, work for the policy development, we are working with the Pri Privacy Commission, and we can talk to the Privacy Commission about how we can also use this information for different purposes than the original intent. Thank you. I look forward to getting updates on some of that. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Chair. Next is Commissioner Carroll. Thanks. Uh, maybe I can first start by asking a question. Uh, this is landmark analysis. Uh, uh, this is amazing. Uh, this is a rich resource for us to have now to, to proceed, but I am nervous about some of the recommendations. So let me start with some of the data. Um, Let's look at that. That there's a whopping statistic there uh, about uh, um, uh, apprehensions or warnings or whatever for loitering at Scarborough Centre. So, what causes a, a transit enforcement officer to to uh, uh, charge someone or warn someone about loitering? What's what are what are classic cases of that? 
Yeah, I think uh, the the issue of of loitering uh, from a criminological work, Kwasi and I are both criminologists, is is a classic discretionary offense, right? Um, uh, and the first thing that has to be done is the the officers have to uh, identify and pay attention to the individuals that they they believe are engaging. Um, so where bias comes in is are certain groups of people more likely to attract attention? So do a group of white teenagers attract the right. same attention? Um, and uh, as a group of, of black uh, uh, youth or do different uh, officers working different locations pay more attention to that? Um, and then there's also the issues of um, discretion uh, when it comes down to uh, what do you do uh, in a case of loitering. With some analysis we've done with the TPS, we've found that um, you know, uh, where a f informal warning might be given uh, um, to, to white youth to move on, um, a formal caution or a formal charge is issued. Um, and that's one of the areas that we really have to um, uh, examine uh, where racial bias can emerge. Um, bias and discretion is going to have more of an impact on minor uh, uh, types of incident than they do on major uh, incidents where discretion is reduced. And it's something we're conscious of and, and will be exploring. So this is this is exactly where I worry about, we have a long way to go, I think, before we could actually act on a recommendation to to get rid of verbal warnings. Because um, when, when I see that the statistics uh, skyrocket at Dundas Station and at Scarborough Centre Station, it, that says to me, okay, a uh, couple of guys have instant messaged each other. A pretty girl from our high school ha has uh, indicated that she's going to go to the movies. Uh, and we know she's getting off at the subway station. She's got to walk through the food court to get to the movies. Let's all just uh, wait for her and say hello. And both of those stations are designed to be a recipe for disaster for that. Um, uh, so you got it, now you've got four or five youths hanging about waiting for that gorgeous girl to get off the subway so they can walk her to the movie theater and chat her up and all the rest of it. I'm talking about normal adolescent behavior. You could be, you could be 12 years old. You could be 14 year, years old. You could be tall and look like a 19 year old. Um, and now you're being observed because you've been there for 15 minutes. Um, but I worry about taking away verbal warning because in a case like that, an enforcement officer is going to observe that behavior. And then finally, he's going to say, okay, well, you guys have been standing around here for 50 minutes. What's the deal? Yeah. Okay, well, move along. You don't get to wait for her here. And she might not even want to be walked by you guys. So come on, guys, where you go. Um, so um, if they're belligerent with him, now he's giving a verbal warning. This is loitering, and the next time I see you here, you're going to get a ticket because one of those kids got mouthy. Um, is is uh, are we if we're going to escalate that to now he has to be given a formal warning? Now he's in the system. Does he have a 208 card? And are things on their way to pretty soon we're sharing this data with the police? Do you see what I mean? It, this could this could cause us more problems than than reduce them. Uh, talk to me about that. Yeah. Um, I'll just I'll just jump in uh, uh, with a couple of comments. I mean, and, and uh, Kwasi uh, mentioned this this earlier. What we've heard in some of our preliminary conversations and have heard through the media are kind of accusations that some groups are treated more leniently. That uh, um, so it's that preferential treatment. So we mentioned, you know, if a group of white kids are going to get a verbal warning, where a group of uh, uh, black kids or indigenous kids would get a formal caution or, or uh, actually a ticket. Um, it's difficult for officers to even sometimes recognize where that bias might be coming in unless there is some kind of form of documentation. And this is why we've you know, uh, um, um, asked for that, because if not, that type of preferential treatment would go um, undocumented. Um, I do get, we do get the concern and we've had con uh, conversations with the the staff about this um, about a formal warning turning into some kind of intelligence document that's going to be reviewed um, and our recommendations will strongly recommend against anything like that in fact we're also con considering possibilities uh, um, where you can de-identify the warnings so that you document the um, 
uh, the backgrounds of who you're warning, but you don't actually have to enter their names or addresses or anything into a system. So they're done more for account accounting purposes than they are for intelligence purposes, as the 208 cards had historically been right. used by the, by, by the TPS. I don't know, Quasi, if you want to add anything. Yeah, I think, you know, just the, the, the point is what we know about discretion and, and we can look, you know, neighboring jurisdictions in a policing sense is that racialized youth are much less likely to benefit from positive discretion that is to be given a break than are white youth. And, you know, we have no reason to yeah. believe that given that this is an enforcement context that that wouldn't be the, at play here as well. We don't know for certain because we don't have access to the full scope of the data. And the point being is that, you know, if the TTC is committed to ensuring fair and equitable service, then it needs to be accountable for the actions uh, of, of and, and understand and be accountable for the actions of its staff. The verbal warning option does not allow the TTC to do that. What's done with that data after it's collected, right. as, as Scott has said, is crucially important. But if that warning sits on the table, when you think about what loitering is and, and what, you know, what troublesome behavior is deemed to be, we know that that's different for black and for white youth. That's, yes. that's, you know, that's well documented in the research literature. Okay. Um, I know I'm out of time, Madam Chair. I had some other questions, but they'd go well beyond another five minutes. So I think we're going to have to find another solution. I might, uh, perhaps I should call a meeting. Can I just ask one question? I think that will help us all. Um, uh, we, I think what we need is a really good idea of, uh, we know there are going to be more focus groups for others, but before we get into speaking, could we just have an understanding of the timeline around some of the recommendations here need to be worked on and we need certain assurances before we can adopt them as policy. What are those timelines and what, what, what future opportunities are we, we going to get to have input into that? Hi there. Um, I'm going to respond to this one, um, uh, Commissioner Carroll. Uh, in June, we are going to be presenting our culture change report for the Revenue Protection and Special Constable Service Department. In there, we will provide timelines on the deliverables that we intend to put forward and um, hope for the endorsement of our work plan that we'll be putting forward. In the work plan, it will address um, where we are with the recommendations for this report, as well as uh, give an update on the Ombudsman Toronto recommendations and AG. Thank you very much. I've got a couple of questions for one. The first one for TTC staff. Uh, how will phase two of the racial equity impact assessment interface with the review Arlene Huggins uh, is currently undertaking? Um, because I think we just, I think that was two meetings ago. I can't remember, but um, important work happening there. So uh, if you could just explain how, how the two would kind of intersect and specifically around the use of discretion and data collection policies. If you could zero in on that piece. Okay. Um, so with phase two, uh, so uh, part of what we're doing with our work plan is that we do um, have discussions, open discussions with our Arlene to uh, make sure that our work plan is holistic, right? Um, with respect to the policies, we are working, uh, we will, um, sorry, conduct those consultations jointly with the professors. So, um, and we'll have checkpoints with uh, Ms. Huggins. Chair, if I could, I'll just jump in for a second, just to make you aware that the, the focus here as the, uh, the special advisor to myself, as well for you as the board, is to make sure that we bring everything together, all right, so that we, everything's coming together coordinated, so we have a comprehensive approach, all right, for the deliverables throughout the remaining part of this year, as well as uh, early next year when the, uh, the phase two assessment comes back. Uh. I'm having trouble a bit technically today. Um, thank you for that answer. Um, it's very impressive. I, I just wanted to know, my understanding is all these fair inspectors and special constables are unionized staff. Did you talk at any point in all your undertakings to the union executive about how they can partner with us 
students. I know you know all these focus groups, and I was going to ask questions about those, but you did a great job describing what you did there. But I, I am curious if you ever spoke to the union executive about these issues, these issues before us. Thank you. You did cut out a little bit there. I know. Sorry. <laughs> I think that was directed at, 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 at the professors, right? That was directed to us. In terms of, uh, we, we haven't had um, an open mind or, or, or any um, kind of in-depth conversations with the union executives, no. We uh, had uh, representatives in some of our meetings, but uh, no, not to the uh, not in the way that you've described them. Okay, we, and uh, go ahead, go ahead. I think it's a good idea. I mean, we have a number of, I mean, one of the reasons for these uh, uh, consultations is to get ideas and identify uh, gaps on the uh, who we should consult with. So we'll definitely, um, you know, reach out and see if that, that's a possibility. And Chair, if I may, it's Rick, it's Rick again. Um, I have had a conversation with the local president of the union uh, just a few times. And Michelle, I know you've been bringing him in, into the loop as well as a number of the cultural changes that you've been making. Okay. I hope you guys can hear me because I seem to be having terrible audio problems um, today. I don't know why. That's never happened to me before. But I guess my other question, I guess, is, I guess, more for maybe the CEO um, is, you know, do we have a zero tolerance approach when it comes to this? I'm talking about the end game here because I, I really am losing my patience with this issue. Um, so, you know, I understand they're unionized staff, but what, what kind of swift action can we take to address these issues and disciplinary action? Can you say anything like, obviously, we're not in camera, but um these these issues have to be dealt with in a swift manner in my opinion that's for you chair you're correct we do have a, a th that approach i have have met with uh, a majority of the special constables and fair inspectors myself over the last uh, year and a half and had those discussions with them it really is and what i've told spoken publicly about is making sure that we do a good job first on educating and making them knowledgeable of what the expectations are and then holding them accountable uh, and so that was very clear to everybody. I've been public on that. And the other part of it is that I've mentioned is the process we're going through now is we're doing it differently than ever in the past. And I always remind uh, others that I had that conversation with Matt Galloway in the late 2019 about you know the definition of insanity. We're bringing experts in to help us get to where we need to go to make that uh, that change. And you uh, you tapped on it not too long, a couple of months back, when you talked about culture change. How long does it take? We do know it's a journey. Right, but we were trying to be as transparent, open, and have those discussions with everybody today so we can get to where we intend to get to. Thank you very much for that answer. We're now moving to speakers. Um, and the uh, person who is up first is Commissioner Bradford because he submitted his um, request to speak. And I believe you have motions. That's right. Thanks. Uh, thanks very much, Madam Chair. Uh, I do have a few motions if we want to put those up on the screen. Uh, and I'd like to just start off by offering my, my thanks and gratitude to uh, Dr. Uwusu Bempa and Dr. Wortley for your, your presentation this morning and all of the extensive work that, that you've brought forward in this report and recommendations. Um, thanks as well to uh, TTC staff for their, their work on this also. Um, there's a wealth of important insights before us today. And, you know, I think even at this interim report stage, um, there's, there's a lot for us to dive into. Um, the motions that you have in front of you here um, are really just to build out the framework for action as this work advances here at the TTC. Um, you know, very briefly, the goal is for the TTC to explore opportunities to share data, align work plans, and expand communications and engagement in order to achieve our shared goals of addressing anti-Black and anti-Indigenous racism across the City of Toronto as a whole. We actually just had a few questions there from our chair, um, kind of looking for opportunities to, for alignment. Uh, and, and that's what this speaks to. Um, you know, I think that um, there's a rich specificity within each file that we deal with here in the city of Toronto, whether that's public transit or, or housing or parks and all of the associated data that comes with that is, is really worth digging into. Um, the report that we have in front of us um, provides extensive details on the concerns, of course, around fair enforcement, um, interactions that we, we have as an agency, uh, and as well as a city. We need to combine that work 
uh, and make sure that uh, the left hand is talking to the right hand, so to speak, um, so that we can begin to address this across across all of our agencies. It's going to take years uh, to undo decades of you know structural discrimination, racism, bias. Um, the re the report speaks to that. And the collection and analysis of the data, of course, is going to be a concrete part of the, the TTC acknowledging um, and understanding the institutional issues that we're facing. Um, the recommendations and, and the detail and the, the further analysis and the pending final report is going to set us up here at the TTC to move this stuff forward. Um, I think it requires all of us as a board, as an agency, um, you know, and as staff to take a, take a, a deep look at the specific incidents uh, we see around fair enforcement, uh, around the use of discretion. I thought that those uh, those insights from the doctors today were particularly uh, uh, interesting, um, but we have to make changes there. Simultaneously, it's not just those incidents or those actions. We have to take the learnings from this report, from this research here, and move forward to confront discrimination at an institutional level across the agency. Um, as we've discussed here previously, there's lots of work underway. Uh, our CEO was just speaking to that, you know, a few meetings ago, uh, the board approved a 10 point plan um, and five year diversity and human rights plan through the guidance of uh, Arlene Huggins. And uh, with all that's taking place here at the TTC commission uh, and at the city of Toronto, it's not, it's not enough to just move things forward through subsequent reports and updates. They have to speak to each other. They have to work together. And if we're going to be accountable to the targets that, that we're setting and make the change that ultimately uh, we, we need to see, uh, we have to drive the pillars of work and communication and action out to our riders, out to our customers, uh, and out to the city. In any large organization, I think that part of that task involves tying streams of work together, um, streams of work that are already underway, uh, and making sure that they're coordinated being persistent, being relentless uh, in our pursuit of that coordination. That's what happens in big bureaucracy. That's what happens in big organizations. Things get siloed, things get separated, and they don't necessarily work seamlessly together. But in order to address this, we really do need a seamless approach. So, you know, folks, our customers, uh, residents here in Toronto, people who ride the TTC, they don't ex have an experience through the lens of the files that we sign work to. Um, every day, our customers transfer between uh, routes and modes of transit. They travel across political boundaries. They access services from different levels of government uh, on any given day. And so it's important that as we move towards establishing the advisory committees and consulting with community stakeholders, uh, we need to make sure that we're, we're hearing insights, we're hearing feedback from riders across the entirety of the city and those who have the lived experience to share on fair enforcement interactions. I think that's really important too. So I'm looking forward to the next report update, seeing this move ahead. And uh, again, big thanks and gratitude to the, the two doctors and all of the staff for their work on this file. Thanks very much. Thank you. Um, next to speak, uh, do you have a question of the mover? I, I do, uh, Madam Chair. Um, it's simply, I just wanted to ask the mover, you say develop policies about sharing data. You want that policy to come back to us for approval, right? We're not delegating that. Absolutely. Oh, okay. I just, um, I, I don't want the community to get nervous about uh, as soon as you see the term sharing data. Um, no, good, good point of People have had some bad life experiences if we share identifiable data. And so uh, 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 we're gonna wanna see that before, before it, uh, uh, gets too far down the road. Okay, uh, great motion, thanks. Thanks, Commissioner. Thank you, and if you can't hear me, Commissioner Carroll, it's because there's leaf blowers outside of my window. So get on that, that's another topic, uh, more related to city council, but they're very, very loud. Um, so let's move on to Commissioner Carroll because uh, I am only aware that she wants to speak. Um, I've got one other speaker, but let's go ahead with Commissioner Carroll. Okay, um, Madam Speaker, I don't have a motion. I, I, I may in June, but I don't have a motion today. But I, I really can support uh, 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 Councillor Brad or Commissioner Bradford's motion because I, I, I think it, it really sort of squares the circle with what we have going on 
around reforms that are going to affect uh, uh, our community response and police response, and it, it it kind of makes sure that we're we're not treading on each other's toes, but that will continue to be clear in all of these initiatives. It's unfortunate, to, I think, Madam Chair, that that we're having to talk about this now because at this moment in real time, our constables and our transit enforcement officers are just they're they're dealing with some of the worst stuff, and it, you know. The, the 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 third wave pandemic uh, uh, transit journey on some uh, modes is so challenging. We they send us pictures on social media of what they're dealing with, and 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 so there's real sensitivity about it. Fortunately, the data that we have analyzed here was all gathered in 2019. You know when we were at a peak and and in in uh, in the before times. So I think. I think we really can, all of us, uh, the board of directors, the staff, the enforcement officers and constables. I think we can all accept this data as as a really good hard look at ourselves. And it shows that we all have some work to do and, and embrace uh, right down to those who are going to have to act on it on the front lines. But I think we all we can all agree. Well, uh, Fenton just uh, demonstrated that uh, Commissioner Jagdio, uh, you know, having been stopped 12 times. It, it, it parents of black children raise their children having to tell them how to behave when you you are stopped by police because you will be um, how you must behave extra well on the TTC because you will be stopped uh, disproportionately that that's gone on for a long time and and we can start this work and they'll still be saying that to their kids and so we're 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 going to have to get to a point where where that's not that's not a justified statement anymore and that's a long journey but i i think that that we have to tread very carefully we have to learn from some of the 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 um the learnings we can take from the toronto police service in dealing with these very same painful issues um dating all the way back to to the carding crisis from 2011 which took until about 2017 to to get to a policy um, with a lot of involvement from community. That was the only way to get there. But I think we have to be really clear um, in the June report and anything going forward, what we mean when we say that we might be taking away ver verbal warnings. Because the net effect of saying you can't card anymore, you can't random stop and, and gather ID was a chilling effect amongst officers. And so they said, well, I guess I can't talk to anybody then. I guess I can only bust you all the way. And that's that. I can't do the kind of community work that builds trust anymore. Some officers, you know, properly read that and 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 worked it out in their annual training and discussed it and, and figured out that how they were going to approach this. Others just got very angry and were vocal about it, both, you know, in their association, their the police union and at uh, provincial associations and such. And, and it has taken a long time to get to where we, we are looking at proper practice. So I would hate to see that happen here because removing verbal warnings is misinterpreted by officers. And they suddenly think, I can't casually say to a group of youth of any color, come on guys, you gotta move along. I, I can't handle it that way anymore. I can only go all the way with a, with a formal warning or an actual charge, or or I'm just not going to do anything at all. And I don't think any rider wants that. So this next piece of the work between, you know, looking at that concept as the, the our experts have asked us to, to look at it and they've given it made a great case for why we have to look at that concept. Now the really important work is going to be making sure that it isn't it doesn't engender a terrible reaction from officers. And it isn't grossly misinterpreted uh, by our writers. And so this is really tricky work. And and I know that the pandemic makes it difficult, but I'm putting my hand up right now. I don't know about the other uh, uh, commissioners, but I think it goes beyond five minutes of questions and five minutes of speaking. I'm really willing to be a, a focus group of our very own to make sure that we're confident of taking a big move like that and what its impact will be on the way enforcement officers function in the space. Thanks, Madam Chair. I think you indulged me in going over time. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And next is uh, Commissioner J. Dio. I think you might have an amendment. 
to um, Commissioner Bradford's motion. Is that correct? Sorry, Councillor or uh, Chair Robinson. No amendment to the current uh, motion on the table. Okay, that that so must have been uh, relating like, correctly. Would, would you like to speak at this time? Uh, no, I, I mean, look, the, the most I'll say here is I, I think everything that's been said by the professors are, are incredibly insightful. This voting on what Councillor Bradford has positioned is a no-brainer, truthfully, and I would encourage all other um, commissioners to view it that way too. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Is there any other speakers on this item? I don't have any other speakers. Um, okay, uh, Commissioner Lai, go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just wanted to, I, I will be very brief and I just wanted to say that this is a very important report and I like to hear that uh, our C a TTC is having a path forward. It's not going to be an easy path, but I, I like to stress that diversity in our city is a fact, but inclusion is a choice. So I, I'm very happy to see that we have both word, the, the keywords in, in, in our TTC um, report, and we have an anti-racism strategy, we have an, a cultural change framework, and these are very, very important things that uh, we would be have to work on. And we, I just wanted to stress the fact that we, we need to address all forms of racism. So. I look forward to uh, receiving the final report and I, I will be supporting uh, Commissioner Bradford's motion because it really is uh, proactive and getting things done quicker uh, instead of waiting for the final uh, report and the recommendation. And I'm sure and I, I look forward to the implementation of, of, of all the uh, policies and I look forward to walk on the path together with, uh, with TTC. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm not aware of any other speakers, so I'll just speak for a couple of minutes. Um, and again, thank the professors and the TTC staff uh, who have all done an excellent job on porting out not just the data, but a way forward. Um, I also want to acknowledge Ben Spur uh, from the Toronto Star. And the reason I want to do this is he did a deep dive on these issues, a very impressive deep dive uh, in 2019 on, on these issues uh, that we're chatting and discussing and debating today. So I think that needs to be acknowledged because um, he was certainly ahead of us in identifying this. The report before us clearly demonstrates uh, that despite some of the progress we've made, we still have much farther to go as an institution. And I think all of us as a commission want to ensure that all transit users feel welcome and respected on the TTC network. And I just think the focus group interviews um, are really, really pivotal to the transformational change that we hope to see. And uh, I think listening to and consulting with all the parties is critically important. And it's just really great to have seen this comprehensive study and report today. Uh, from both the external supporters here, as well as uh, our internal staff. So we're looking for transformational change and uh, we recognize there's a problem. There's no doubt. I hear about it constantly from staff. Uh, we have a, an amazing new chief diversity and culture officer who has only been here a short while, but uh, already in the hot seat working on these issues. And, and seems to be already uh, rep representing us very well. So as you'll recall, as a board in December, we adopted the TTC's 10 point action plan and five year diversity and human rights plan to support diversity and inclusion in all facets of the TTC. So there is a plan and there is a way forward. And I think these initiatives currently underway do in definitely demonstrate that the TTC is not satisfied with the status quo. We are not satisfied with the status quo, but there is a plan. And that gives us, as I said earlier, a way forward. So take swift action, necessary action in response to the phase of uh, phase one of this report or the phase one report. And I also want to emphasize we're spending $2.4 million on anti-racism initiatives. At an organization in this year, in 2021, dollars to 
within the TTC organization. So I'm glad to see that uh, there's such a commitment to this, that it's being prioritized. I have to say, I've said it before, I hear about it constantly from TTC staff. It's top of mind and I'm proud of that. So some of the questions may sent a bit of a chill down other to relate to other mothers who are dealing with an issue I don't have to. And, and it is chilling. hope we can address this swiftly and I'm uh, I'll end on that note and I guess we would move now staff recommendations sorry chair we will consider Commissioner Bradford's motion first ah uh, thank you for the reminder so amendments uh, uh, if you could just put it up on the screen for everybody to take another quick look at it, it was quite lengthy Commissioner Bradford's motions or amendments to the report. And there they are. Hopefully you've all had a chance to read them. All in favor? Opposed? I can't see you, but anyway. All in favor? Opposed? That carries. Uh, and the actual staff recommendations, if someone would like to move those. Commissioner, did So move. Who was, okay, so who, who move said that? Carol. Councillor Carroll, so Council, moved. Commissioner Carroll moved them. All those in favor, opposed, that carries. Okay, so we are at 12.06. Um, we do have um, representatives from OPG and Toronto Hydro standing by. That's why the uh, order of the paper um, and the agenda. Um, are we willing to continue on item to item six and item seven that have been bundled? Um, so that we have both the reps from Toronto Hydro and OPG here. Are people willing to continue? Because they have been standing by all morning. Okay, heads are shaking. So we will move to item six. Uh, we do have a registered speaker on this item. Um, so I will ask Emily, I believe it's Emily who is uh, our first to maybe only speaker on this item. If you would like to uh, join us now. Hi everybody. Um, yeah, it's me, I think that's Toronto is kind of here. Um, I think on all three models of the investors, the first pair of the... Excuse me, Madam Chair, Madam Chair, I hate to interrupt, but we're, it, it's really difficult to hear the step in it. Is there any way to make that clearer? Um, to the clerk, it's can you address that audio? Through the chair. chair. Yes, it is. Thank you, Emily. Okay. Sorry about that. Hey, everyone. Um, so, yeah, I live back in Toronto. Um, I miss you all, and I hope someday we get to be back together in the community room one. Um, I'm kind of nervous because I'm not used to doing WebEx meetings by phone So because of my hearing impairment, so hopefully it'll go well. I've been on all three models of the e-buses. Um, the Proterra, the new flyer version, and the other version. Can't remember the name of it right now. As a person with multiple disabilities, as well as the wife of a um, husband who has visual impairments and physical disabilities, who uses a white cane and a sport cane when needed, I have some serious safety concerns. My main concerns are with the Proterra model, um, especially with the wheelchair seating on the window at, on the door side of the bus when and I, and I have concerns for elderly people um, people visual impairments especially uh, as well and people in wheelchairs the way the constraint system is put in it's an afterthought there I said it it's an afterthought I don't know who was testing these buses from ACAT um, I don't know who got in these buses if they're visually impaired in a wheelchair, in a power wheelchair especially, or if you had people with guide dogs and white canes and whatnot checking out these buses because I can tell you from lived experience of over, I've been using them since they came out and there's serious tripping hazards with the Q-strain system in the door side of the bus front seat. Um, especially if you flip up the small seat, the first little seat, and 
you know, or if you're trying to flip out the one for the wheelchair, there's not, a, there's also a very tight space to get into the front of the bus and people in large scooters and people in scooters in general are going to have problems. I already have problems with my power wheelchair getting in the bus. The shields already sometimes will hit my joystick, which is extremely dangerous for my driving. It's extremely dangerous for navigating. And it's also extremely dangerous if you're visually impaired. I would like to respectively ask whoever thought of these buses, whoever went to these bus providers and said, hey, we need this, 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 and this. We need, you know, AODA, we need accessibility. I wish it had been people in manual and power wheelchairs and scooters and those who are visually impaired testing this because I have safety issues every time I use them, especially the Proterras. The, for one thing, the stop call button for the wheelchairs, it's a plunger like thing. I constantly, every time I board, I get snagged on that button. Part of it's in a really bad spot for a lot of us who are in power wheelchairs. It's too far back for one thing. It's hard to reach once you're in the position. You literally have to almost tie yourself in a pretzel trying to get to that button in time for the operators to stop and, and have enough time for him to position his bus to the stop. And it's really frustrating and concerning. And it's a safety risk. There's tripping hazards with the Q strain system, both front and back. And I'm really concerned that someone is gonna fall or someone's gonna get injured and possibly sue TTC. I don't wanna see that happen. But as a person with multiple disabilities, he's also a trans, full-time transit user. And as someone who is a very proud advocate for the disabled community and with the disabled community, I have issues. You know, those buses are great. They're great e-buses. They do great things for the environment. But there's more to think of than just the environment in the city of Toronto with as many people with disabilities as we have in the city and with our aging population. Thank you very much for your time and I appreciate your feedback. Thank you. Any questions? Okay, thank you very much for your uh, remarks today. Uh, we'll make sure thank to you. Uh, think about those. Um, thank you very much. You're welcome, thank you. So we're going to now move to um, uh, our, ask our CEO to introduce some of our partners. Um, so I will actually uh, ask Rick Leary now to introduce um, some of the people in attendance related to this report. Okay, thank you very much, Chair. Uh, through you, Chair, again. A um, little history, just going back uh, to November of 2017, it was proposed to this board that the TTC purchase its first 30 battery electric bu vehicles, buses, and related charging systems to begin the transformation or transition to a fully electric fleet as part of our green fleet program. In June of 2018, the board approved an additional procurement of 30 more electric buses. Today, I'm pleased uh, that the TTC has 60 electric battery electric vehicles on the road in the city of Toronto, the largest zero emissions fleet in all of North America. And we are taking uh, two more big steps towards a greener and more sustainable future. We'll be presenting two reports. The first, which discusses the preliminary results of the TTC's innovative head-to-head -head evaluation, will advise the next steps for bus procurement and provide more details on how well these new vehicles are integrating into our systems. We're also recommending the procurement of approximately 300 long-range battery electric buses, which will make even more significant impact on our fleet and ultimately contribute to the better air quality and a cleaner city for the city of Toronto. The second report focuses on a tripartite framework of agreement with Ontario Power Generation and Toronto Hydro for implementation and further e-bus electrification of infrastructure, a very important part of this plan's reality. The program delivery model, where the transit system works with its hydro utilities to invest, deliver, own, and operate public transit electrification infrastructure is a first, is a first for the three parties. It's also an area of significant innovation where the TTC has taken the lead role in advancing industry best practices. As we modernize and transform this organization, we do it with experts in this field. 
Vehicle electrification is a key component of the City of Toronto's Transform TO Climate Action Plan, which targets an 80% reduction in local greenhouse gases or gas emissions by 2050. The transition to the TTC's bus fleet to 100% zero emissions will significantly advance the city's innovation and sustainability objectives. And as you're well aware, our goal is to get a fully implemented electrified feet by 2040. Now what I'm gonna do is I'll introduce you to Bem Case. Uh, under his leadership, the TTC has become known within the transit community for its innovative approach to electrification and product evaluation, its eagerness to collaborate with peer agencies and business partners, and its proven track record to deliver capital vehicle programs. And what I'd also like to do is before I turn it over to, to Bem, is uh, to, so he'll give us the results of the innovative head-to-head -head evaluation and the recommended uh, next steps working with OPG and Toronto Hydro. But I'd also, I'm very pleased to introduce you to two individuals that we have here today. Ken Hartwick, the President and CEO of Ontario Power Generation. A little wave, uh, Ken, if you would. As well as uh, Elias Liber... Liber I'm going to say it right, uh, Elias. All right. Libero Janis, <laughs> the Executive Vice President of Toronto Hydro. So, Bem, uh, you give a little wave at Elias as well. Bem, I'll turn it over to you, and then we'll, we'll uh, take questions. Thank you, Rick. Um, and through uh, uh, Chair Robinson, hello, everyone. Try to get my system to work here. Thank you. Um, I'll start with an overview of TTC's Green Bus Program and summarize key takeaways from the two Green Bus reports in front of you. The TTC's head-to-head -head evaluation of e-buses and the recommended framework for agreement between TTC OPG, that is Ontario Power Generation, and Thessel, Toronto Hydro, for delivery of electrification infrastructure. In July of 2017, City Council approved the Transform TO Climate Action Plan setting target to reduce greenhouse gas emissions 80% by 2050. The first phase of TTC's Green Bus Program was approved by the TTC board just four months later in November of 2017. And over the three plus years that followed, TTC procured over a thousand low to zero emissions buses, all under the Government of Canada's Public Transit Infrastructure Fund. Of the 1,043 buses procured, 738 were clean diesel, 255 hybrid electric, and 60 were all battery electric. The TTC's last clean diesel bus, which reduced emissions by 25% and continues to save TTC $4.5 million per year in fuel, was received in June of 2018. That milestone was shared with delivery of our first second generation hybrid electric bus. Hybrids are a transition technology for our operators and maintainers, and as such, are key to electrification plans. Hybrids reduce emissions by close to 50% over the conventional diesel buses they replace. And the 555 hybrids we'll have just next year will save the TTC $14 million a, a year in fuel. The last 60 of the 1,048 buses were all battery electric, making the TTC zero emissions fleet the largest in North America. With approval of these reports, TTC will apply lessons learned through the e-bus head-to-head evaluation to the procurement of an additional 300 battery electric buses. TTC will also work with Ontario Power Generation and Toronto Hydro to build on the charging infrastructure it has today and enable full fleet electrification by 2040, 10 years ahead of the Transform TO target. One of the ways we're looking, taking on this challenge is through the head-to-head -head evaluation of all, uh, all electric buses from BYD, Canada, New Flyer Industries, and uh, Proterra. When considering the results presented here, it is important to understand that the buses we have today were designed five years ago and that the rapidly maturing technology um, means that all vendors have been quick to respond to adopt lessons learned. It may be tempting to read these results and conclude that one or more suppliers has the advantage going into the next TTC e-bus procurement. However, it must be clear that that's not the case. I've seen the production pipeline for all manufacturers, and I can assure you that our experience is being applied in real time to the design of buses they will offer in the future. So with this report, um, although this report does not tell us who will be successful in the next procurement, it does demonstrate the TDC has gained the experience it needs to inform our commercial and technical requirements going forward. There are nine evaluation domains, including system compatibility, accessibility, customer experience, operator and maintainability, maintainer experience, 
maintainability, cost, vendor, vehicle, and charging system performance. The objective is to evaluate all three bus types, the infrastructure, the vendors, and the TTC context, and leverage our findings as lessons learned for future adoption. Over the next few slides, I'll describe key takeaways from our preliminary report. All transit authorities have constraints that form must-have requirements for the pr procurement of transit vehicles. Any bus we procure in large quantities must be physically compatible with existing garage constraints, must have proven charging technology that's interoperable with other manufacturers, and must have proven corrosion resistant frame structure. Physical compatibility. The industry standard bus length is 40 feet. BYD and New Flyer meet this standard. Potera uses a 42 and a half foot long bus. This may not be an issue for other event for other transit authorities. However, based on our bus garage layout, procurement of additional buses greater than 40 foot in length will result in a loss of storage capacity of, of at least 10%. Charging interoperability. The industry has adopted SAE or the Society of Automotive Engineers uh, standards for the charging systems to ensure that, that buses from different manufacturers are compatible with common infrastructure and to enable high speed charging both in depot and en route. New Flyer and Proterra buses meet this standard. At the time, however, in 2018, BYD only offered an AC charge technology in the industry and had not yet landed on the, D, the DC platform. Um, BYD is currently offering both platforms, and so this shouldn't be a barrier in the future. The AC system how, uh, works well for the most part and offers some unique benefits. However, we must follow the CSA standard to ensure interoperability and competition in our bus procurements. Corrosion resistant frame. Over the TDC's history, we have had bus, streetcar, bus fleet, and subway fleets with significant structural issues due to corrosion, stress cracks, and so on. And it is our operations and ultimately our customers who have suffered as a result. As we look to scale up adoption of e-buses, we must limit exposure to this risk. New Flyer and Proterra meet this requirement. New Flyer uses a stainless steel frame, while Proterra buses fiberglass composite. While BYD is now offering a stainless steel frame, the bus we procured has a frame made of mild steel and BYD employs an annual rust proofing program. The buses we procured from, new, from both Proterra and BYD have a novel solution to mitigate the risk of corrosion. Uh, both, however, present their own challenges and introduce long-term unknowns, given they have not been proven in our environment specifically over the lifetime of a bus. However, as mentioned, we understand that development pipelines for both Proterra and BYD include buses that in time promise to meet all of the requirements mentioned above. Additionally, Nova Bus is releasing a long range battery electric bus that also promises to be compliant with all these requirements. All three bus manufacturers are compliant with applicable CSA and AODA standards for accessible transit buses. As with all vehicle procurements, the TDC strives to exceed these minimum requirements and includes the Advisory Committee on Accessible Transit through various stages of the design and procurement process. Prior to finalizing the design of the next e-bus procurement, ACAT will be engaged along with a broader customer focus group to evaluate what works. I'll just mention on the side here that the, uh, the issue that Emily raised uh, in her deputation had been identified by ACAT and we're working with Proterra to uh, effect a retrofit to address that issue. Many factors contribute to vehicle performance, but the primary ones of concern for e-bus adoption include reliability, availability, and energy consumption. In the transit industry, reliability is measured by calculating the mean distance between service affecting failures. As a reliability graph shows, a baseline hybrid electric bus from Nova has greatly exceeded the target of 30,000 mean distance between failures. Our new flyer buses have also exceeded the target, but are not performing on par with the hybrids. Our BYD buses are trending in a positive direction, but have limited in-service experience and our Proterra fleet appears to be plateauing below target. The key takeaway from what we've learned on the reliability of electric buses is that roughly that only 5% of failures are in, are in the propulsion system. Therefore, given some time for the industry to mature, an electric bus is expected to perform on par with a diesel bus or hybrid, and, will be introduced, and we will be introducing contractual requirements to ensure that they do. Bus fleet availability is a measure of how often buses are free of defects when they're needed for service and is reported as a percentage. Availability should be as close to 100% as possible so that all fleet assets are available when needed. 
However, a target of 80% was established for this valuation. As a reference point, again, the baseline hybrids from NOVA consistently achieved above 95%. New Flyer struggled initially, but is now exceeding the target and trending in the right direction. Neither BYD or Proterra are meeting the target, nor are they trending in the right direction. Key takeaway, the, major, uh, the majority of times that an electric bus is not available for service, it's because we're waiting for engineering support from the vendor or waiting on spare parts. Again, like with reliability, given the time for the supply chain to mature and the appropriate contractual incentives, an electric bus is expected to perform on par with a hybrid bus. Bus energy consumption is highly influenced by what we refer to as the duty cycle, which includes passenger loading, driving behavior, frequency of door cycling, um, which requires interior or heating or cooling, and of course, route topography. In order to minimize all the variables and isolate which bus was the most efficient and consistent, a controlled engineering test was performed on select routes to, to evaluate seasonal energy consumption. The key takeaway, we've learned from this test that the bus setup, which is configurable across all three bus types, plays a large role in both the uh, relative efficiency and the variation in efficiency from season to season. For example, buses, rate of acceleration or deceleration, the use of diesel-fired heater, how the regenerative braking reacts to slippery road conditions. Does it turn off momentarily or does it turn off for the rest of the day? Going forward, we'll develop a standard configuration that optimizes energy consumption and range. In summary, we look at uh, all the key domains that require some degree of uh, improvement. In fact, all, all vendors do. Uh, over the past several years, we have been working actively with our business partners and industry peers to ensure that lessons learned through this evaluation are applied and that all vendors are able to make the necessary improvements. As the vast majority of issues we manage day to day are not related to the propulsion system itself, we are confident that with a strong specification for future procurements, there's no barrier to proceeding with the next uh, procurement of TTC's 300 battery electric buses. As a result of this work, we expect strong competition between multiple vendors. In conclusion, preliminary results are informed are informing our next procurement of both hybrid and battery electric buses. The head-to-head -head evaluation must continue with the aim of improving, optimizing, and optimizing both vehicle and vendor performance. Operational risk is being managed by limiting the number of buses deployed at any given garage and through strong commercial and technical requirements. Lastly, the negotiated request for proposal process employed for previous hybrid and e-bus procurements have proven invaluable in the context of these technologies. It has enabled the flexibility to work with prospective vendors in an open and a fair manner to maximize our business objectives and maximize value for money. Now I'll talk about the framework for agreement between TTC, OPG, and Toronto Hydro. Presented here are photos of just some of the infrastructure that has been installed by TTC and Toronto Hydro at three of our eight garages to provide power to our existing bus fleet. Backup generators that provide six megawatts of emergency backup generation at Aero Garage, uh, energy storage systems at all three garages, switch gear, and of course, chargers and dispensers for connecting to the buses and charging those buses. Despite all of the changes, sorry, the challenges with uh, design, procurement, and installation during 24 7 operations, TDC and Toronto Hydro successfully delivered the required infrastructure on time and on budget. As described in the report, the, the sequence of garage electrification was prioritized in consideration of physical constraints, ridership at each garage, and through the use of an equity lens. To ensure charging capacity is available ahead of TDC's green bus procurement schedule, three or four bus garages will, need, will be in construction at any given time over the next 15 years. This significant undertaking requires careful consideration of the scope and who is best positioned to deliver it. In the TTC OPG FESEL or Toronto Hydro uh, framework for agreement, TTC's role is to define high level scope timing, to secure funding, coordinate among stakeholders internally, and to provide oversight to design uh, procurement, construction, and operational performance. Toronto Hydro's role is to upgrade feeders and provide reliable electricity to TTC, op to TTC properties. In this innovative delivery model, OPG's role is to co-invest, design, build, own, and operate all required infrastructure and control systems on TTC sites. 
Before I summarize the key takeaways from this report, I would like to draw your attention to one of the most significant benefits of this delivery model. As T2C is not responsible for owning and maintaining electrification assets, our operations can stay focused on our core business of delivering safe and reliable service to our customers. In conclusion, with the help of KPMG, we have assessed available capital delivery models and found that the TTC OPG vessel framework for agreement offers the highest potential benefit and lowest overall risk. The alignment of purpose and approach between transit agencies and its utilities has, in our experience, already proven invaluable to delivering on time and on budget. The opportunity to engage OPG as a co-investor and and owner throughout the asset life cycle is a unique one in this particular application and will allow again TTC to focus delivering safe and reliable service. Thank you. Thank you very much for the presentation, very comprehensive and detailed. Uh, we're gonna move now to speakers. Uh, no, we're moving to questions. So I've got uh, on my list here, the first person is the vice chair. Can you put me down too, Jay? Likewise, please. Sorry, I'm locked out of my email. Same, me too. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> didn't expect to be up so quickly. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Um, you know, buses are uh, our workhorse in TGC. We often, I think, forget that they move more people than anybody else and any, you know, any streetcar or any any of our streetcars and, and subways put together, I think, uh, if my uh, recollection is correct. So it is important that we um, that we make sure that they are uh, comfortable to use and easy to use and accessible and so on. So glad to hear that uh, we're going to involve uh, ACAT in a, in a much more uh, substantive way um, in the testing. Um, my question goes to the operational testing we've done so far. Um, we've um, the testing has really been done during COVID period, which uh, has meant uh, lighter um, riders because not as many people are taking uh, transit, and of course our our streets are lighter as well. So, to what extent? Um, so my question goes to: To what extent is the you know the operating data we have so far reliable, and don't we really need to put them through? Um, the regular operations within the city where the uh, riders, you know, the volume is going to be greater, but also the, the traffic um, situations will be um, much more um, challenging and therefore will we'll demand more of the bus. So uh, that's, that's my question for you. Thank you. Yeah, through the chair, in some areas of, of the network, of course, we are still seeing high ridership, including areas served by uh, the electric bus fleet. Um, additionally, I'd add though that uh, the engineering test we performed uh, applied 9,000 pounds of ballast, uh, so weight basically, to each of the three bus types. And that was used and they were run throughout 43 different routes in, the, in our network um, um, that represented the entire network. So about, um, again, 43% of those. So that, that test um, was considered a heavy duty cycle test. And because the, the weight on board of that test represented about 60 passengers. Um, and then you also had uh, the, the bus stopping at every stop and opening and cycling doors. And so all the acceleration decelerations that you would see under a very heavy duty scenario were tested in that engineering test. So I think we've, um, or I know we have um, successfully uh, modeled a uh, conservative case when it comes to loading. Are those all your questions? Did you have another? Uh, yes, I'm done. I'm done. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Our next um, uh, person to question is Commissioner Bradford. Thanks, Madam Chair. Um, and thanks for the presentation, Ben. That, uh, that's great. Could you um, walk me through how the TTC uh, has reviewed or considered alignment with um, the potential federal funding initiatives uh, for e-buses that have been coming forward, how that relates to this exercise here with the 300 buses. Um, I, I, if you don't mind, if, if I, I could put that over to uh, either Josie or Karen Thorburn. Sure.
Uh, Chair, it's Rick Leary. I'll take this one. So just so you're aware, uh, Councillor, we have continued to have uh, discussions with the uh, federal government regarding uh, what the next budget will look like. We we haven't got any specifics, but we do know that uh, top in their agenda is looking at uh, electrifying uh, buses with right across Canada and the numbers that they're talking about are thousands. But they, we don't have enough detail at this point yet to provide uh, this board with that information. OK, uh, thank you, sir. Um, more questions, I guess, about procurement. What would the, could you provide us with some context on what a typical uh, order size for e-buses might be in the North American context? I know we do streetcars and we do like 60. Uh, 300 is obviously a lot more than that. They're a less yeah. expensive vehicle in comparison. So what, what, what would be comparable? Is, it, is, this, is this high, is this low, is this average? Where would this place us in the North American context? In the North American context for electric buses uh, specifically, this would t place us at the top there. So uh, meaning that, you know, we have today, we have the largest uh, electric bus fleet in North America. Uh, with the procurement of that 300, we would continue to have uh, the largest fleet in North America in um, uh, through 24 and, and possibly into 2025. Um, in terms of the, the size of the procurement relative to uh, a normal bus procurement, um, as mentioned previously, uh, we had procured very recently 723 uh, diesel buses. In fact, we procured many more since prior to that. And, and our steady state procurement level at 190, roughly 190 buses per year, uh, means that um, these 300 are um, uh, significant in scale when it comes to the adoption of electric buses, but about a medium in scale, if you will, for bus procurements generally. Okay. Now, I, I noticed, and, and you were very detailed in your presentation with some of the, um, I don't know if you call them deficiencies or shortcomings across the three different uh, buses that we're testing. Interestingly, it seems less to be related to the actual um, um, electric motors or the propulsion. It's actually more about the, the physical units of the vehicle um, with so many considerations and, and some identified shortcomings there does it make sense for us to procure such a large amount at this time with so many questions up in the air unresolved and i guess how so, confident would you be that the vendors would be able to adequately address the you know significant amount of considerations that you've outlined in your initial uh, findings here so we are confident that that what we've gained from this exercise are clear uh, requirements for the next procurement, both commercial and technical, to address both vendor and vehicle performance. Um, we have uh, a good handle on, you know, we've got a lot of experience with all of those types of failures that are, are occurring on electric buses because they're, it's got nothing to do with it being an electric bus. So we're very, we're very well versed with, with dealing with those types of failures. The key is going to be um, to introduce things like uh, reliability performance metrics and availability performance metrics, which the, the transit agency or sorry, industry in North America has not previously required for buses. We have for rail vehicles, but not for buses. So we're going to start introducing some of these requirements to help. I just realized my risk. time is going down, not up. So uh, very quickly, are those um, the deficiencies that we've identified? Why do you think you're seeing deficiencies not on the you know electric electric motor piece, but actually on the buses physically themselves? Why do we see that here? I think uh, I was talking with some of the with all the vendors, and in, in fact, about this over the last several days, and the the biggest reason probably is the establishment of the industry in Canada in particular. So um, as BYD Canada becomes more established, as Proterra becomes more established in Canada, as new flyers supply chain uh, for battery electric buses in Canada matures, uh, most of those issues will, uh, most of those availability issues and reliability issues will go away. There are some engineering issues that need to be resolved and we can address that again through the technical specifications. I have one final question very quickly. If you could ask it quickly. Okay, yeah. So. I, the, the recommendations are asking for the board to delegate authority to the CEO to uh, to issue this uh, negotiated request for proposal. Um, why would we do that today on such a significant order in terms of e-buses versus waiting to see if these issues from the different vendors could be resolved a little bit further 
uh, why is the timing at this meeting significant? Why do we need to move this today versus, you know, in the fall or something when we have more clarity? So and the decision to, to yeah, sure. So the decision to move um, the the procurement of electric buses specifically out to the fall or later is also a decision to procure hybrid buses instead of those electric buses, because the the, the time that we need the buses to replace uh, those that are at end of life. In fact, we've got um, a good portion of our fleet that's becoming turning 17 years old, so well beyond the design life. They need to be replaced um, starting in 2022, 23, 24, and so on. So uh, deferral of, of this uh, uh, procurement would mean uh, buying hybrids instead of electric, and we are confident in buying 300 electric. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Commissioner Lalonde, you're next. Thank you, Madam Chair. I had a few questions. The, the first one is, are there any new bus suppliers, e-bus e suppliers out there that we should be considering for testing? There are a couple of uh, new suppliers that uh, are establishing themselves, one in Canada, one in the United States, that, um, that we may see bids from. Um, uh, the, we know that they're uh, very um, early on in their development cycle. They haven't produced many buses at all. Uh, but uh, they may very well bid. In in that scenario, uh, negotiated procurement process, which is one of the advantages of this, is it would allow us to consider what risk uh, would be taking on, we would be taking on by awarding, um, um, you know, a, a contract to one of those up, kind of upstarts, if you will. And, and we would have to take a conservative approach, similar to what we did with the first batch of B buses. But it would potentially give you the option of, of maybe buying a few buses from those types of manufacturers for further testing. That's correct. Okay. Um, second question is, in terms of what you're learning on the, the actual range and charging times for these buses, what implication, if any, does that have for the size of our fleet? If, if, we, were, if we were looking to transform everything to, to electric, is the range slash charging time good enough that we'd actually replace buses on a one-for-one -one basis or would we need more electric buses because they they don't run as far or as long before they require charging today the range is not good enough for long range um battery electric buses so uh a long range bus which means that it's charged at the at the garage and then goes out for maybe 15 hours of service and comes back to be recharged will accommodate about 40 percent of our our routes and the remaining 60 percent uh, we expect, of course, the gap to close because we're not going to be converting our fleet overnight anyway. So over the next five, 10 years, we expect that gap to close. But also, um, we do think that for the longest routes, we we'll either have to split the routes, in which case that may result in an increase um, of buses required, uh, and or um, introduce hydrogen fuel cell buses, which have no such rate constraints, but there are of course challenges around uh, the fuel um, there and the, and the delivery of those the fuel or on the charging. So there are solutions for those longest routes um, that are actually available today, uh, but we don't need to um, uh, determine that question or the answer to that question just yet, because we've got several years of procurements of long range buses um, uh, within that 40% I mentioned. So that's very helpful uh, information. One of the things that I'd like to see is kind of an ongoing brief on the, the economics of, of e-buses versus traditional buses. Um, not because you know I'm looking to, to downplay the, the move to electric. I think we're all committed to, to do that or to you know zero emission buses. But I think we should do so knowing what the economics look like. And I, I think if you if you folks could design some kind of metrics that we could follow on an ongoing basis uh, as to you know how e buses compare with the hybrid buses um, in terms of you know fleet size range but, but boiling it down to an economic model, I suspect that that analysis today would suggest that if we if we told you to buy you know the whole fleet uh, as e buses we need a lot more buses and that would probably outweigh the the energy savings that um, that we would get and we expect that's going to change dramatically over the next few years as the technology evolves but i think it'd be useful for us to just follow that evolution so that we know um you know how it's going that's all i had madam chair thank you very much for those uh 
questions and remarks. Uh, next is Commissioner Min and Wong. Okay, um, thanks, Jay. I'll ask my first set of questions uh, on procurement. The recommendations seem. So oh, actually, the first question actually was goes back to, I think, Councillor Bradford's question: Why? Are, why don't we wait? Isn't one of the reasons why we're waiting is because there's money, federal money available, and we need to buy them now to sort of get into that get that federal money. Uh, that's correct. However, um, this was always part of the green bus procurement plan as laid out several years ago so that we would be buying electric buses in this time frame. But there's money available right now. That's why we should buy them now because that money might not be available a couple of years from now, right? right. And it may not apply to hybrids. Because they right. right. So the the recommendations on the on the procurement of buses seem come somewhat convoluted in as much as you tested three buses. You found one that's you like better, but you're going to enter into a procurement process. Can you kind of it seems like unusual mm -hmm. that maybe only one might qualify, but you still have to go through a procurement process. Can you kind of sort of sort that out? Sure. Yeah. So uh, as I mentioned during the the um, presentation, I know that, that that's uh, kind of uh, one way of interpreting the report it's not the way it's meant to be interpreted so the way the report's meant to be interpreted is that it it informs our requirements um, we know that uh, both byd and proterra are making developments uh, new flyer as well and that they'll all be uh, kind of upping their game if you will for the next procurement and so we expect that the performance of sorry the, the next procurement or the first like, procurement? uh well in both so, so the, 300, the 300 right the 300 yes and so what they bid with on the 300 should or will, we expect, and, I, and again, I've seen the pipeline of development, so uh, it will address many of the issues, if not all the issues that we've laid out today. So even though one of, like, let's say Proterra didn't come in first, they could still win um, the RFP if they kind of meet all your requirements, right? Yep, As it's an open, panel? it's a public procurement, so yes. Okay. Um, I did... Uh, how much does a bus cost? Any bus cost? Uh, the buses we procured on average were about uh, 1.2 million dollars. Uh, we right. paid as little as uh, just under a million, and as much yeah. as 1.3. Okay. Uh, I, we we I, are expecting, however, just to answer that question further, that that price go down in the next procurement, yeah. and and our market sounding suggests that we should be paying, uh, on average, closer to a uh, million dollars. Right. I, I want to switch gears over to um, the uh, electrification piece. So I have a number of, this is I guess a little bit more interesting. So you need, it's $500 million to, in, to do the install for the electrical, right? That's but correct. I find it interesting that OPG is paying for it. Um, number one, number two. So, so just a wanna... correction, sorry. So they're not paying for the whole uh, amount. There are certain assets that they're willing to co-invest in or to pay for. That's the, the revenue generating assets. Um, you'll see more of this in, in Q3 when we come back with the commercial terms that they propose. But right now what's on the table is that they would be uh, investing in, uh, um, let's say uh, $5 million out of 40 at a given garage. Five, uh, five million, so most of it's on us. So you, so, is our side five half a billion dollars for the install? Because that was the number in the report. The budget half requests billion, five the, million. The budget request um, it includes the total estimated cost and does not yet discount uh, any amount that OPG would be uh, funding, uh, because of course we don't have uh, a formal master agreement binding master agreement with OPG. So, following again coming back in uh, by Q3 of this year. And if the board approves the the um, uh, master agreement with OPG, then we would be adjusting our our budget accordingly. And is that for eleven hundred odd charging stations? Is that how many charging stations? No, ultimately we would need uh, enough charging stations for um, five thousand, uh, right? Well, twenty twenty four hundred, twenty four hundred buses that are that are planned that we plan to have in twenty forty. Okay, I'm curious about that. Is that the 500 million or is that even more? The 500 million is the, um, is the 10 year ask. So that's- Oh, it's a 10 year ask. It's a 10 year ask. So it's, 
and and it's about um, eighty percent, however, of the overall uh, requirement. And that's in and above the million the the million bucks a bus, right? That's just for infrastructure, yes. And so, if you add on the cost of that, I get um, average it out. It's a little bit more, right? Yeah, except that. Um, so to do that economic analysis uh, that was just requested, we'd have to also look at the life of each of the electrification assets, because some of those yeah. assets are 60 years long, sure, whereas the bus is, uh, you know, 12, 13 years. Okay. Um, I think I'm done. If you can put me down to speak, um, Matt, Chair. Thank you. Um, Commissioner McKelvey, you're next. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'm just wondering about, you know, when is when does the cash drop? And I know you're having discussions with the, the federal government, but you know, what is the the date that you really need to know about if we're having matching funds? And um, if we don't get matching funds, is there a backup plan? So our request for matching funds applies to both to the hybrids and the electric. So the hybrid buses, uh, we plan to go to RFP in the next uh, couple of weeks, in fact, and issue the award in Q3 of this year. So by Q3 of this year, we would in order to be eligible under the uh, incrementality rules, um, we would need that funding in place. For the all electric buses, um, roughly the same time frame, except the award is planned for Q4, uh, perhaps early Q1 of next year. Okay, and I, I see that you have no showstoppers from a technical point of view, but you did also look at contract delivery and in that, and you know we've certainly had problems with other suppliers in the past, so. You know, how are you factoring into this decision about them all being, you know, pre-qualified, for example? Yeah, so that's one thing that we haven't um, worked out just yet in terms of the late deliver deliverables, I mean. So we have we have LDs, we have liquidity damages on late deliveries. We applied that in this, uh, in this case. Um, we need to take a close look at whether um, uh, there should be an escalating uh, LD so that if you're late beyond a certain point, that LD um, uh, becomes higher as a further disincentive, obviously, and also to, to reflect the, the, the actual um, uh, harm to TTC if we don't have buses in time to replace uh, others that are at the end of life, because it does cost us money to keep those on the road. So we are thinking about these options and, and we'll be working that out um, before the, uh, the e-bus RFP hits the street to the end of the year. Okay, and then I appreciate that they're all going to have model improvement, but, you know, I, I once bought a Ford Contour and that's because, you know, we did all our research and it was winning all these awards and it was a great car. And then the year we bought was like a total lemon. Um, and, you know, it was a disaster of a car after doing all of that research. So, um, you know, what, how, how do we account for that? Because now there's going to be new models that we're actually, mm -hmm. you know, going to be buying. Will there be tests of those? Will we have early de delivery of a few for tweaking, et cetera? Because, like, you know, last thing you want is 300 buses and they all have one problem that, you know, you've got to address on them and some major recall and we're in trouble. I would just say that there's, there's that element of risk with every vehicle procurement we make. Um, and so, for example, the hybrids that we just procured, we had done our due diligence, went out, decided after many, many years, decades of not buying hybrids uh, to start buying them again, um, or a decade, I think, of not buying them again. And, um, and it worked out well because we had done our due diligence. So all you can do is your due diligence. And, uh, but the, the risk of a, of a lemon fleet is a significant one. And um, the only thing you can do is, uh, again, your due diligence and have appropriate contractual requirements uh, to, uh, to protect you there. Okay, and then, you know, we've been kind of selling this as, you know, the, the ability to test these e-bus e technology in, in the Canadian winters and that there's lessons learned that we could share with other municipalities. So um, what do we find on that? And what is the message that we should be sharing widely with, you know, other cities in Toronto that are, uh, sorry, other cities in Canada that are looking to learn from this? There are a number of technical lessons along those lines that we have learned, uh, some good things to start with. The, um, the charging performance ha has not uh, been impacted by different uh, like swings in temperature. So the rate at which a bus charges, whether it's indoor or outdoor, uh, uh, doesn't make a difference really. That's a good thing, obviously. Um, we see that the slip conditions uh, on our roads um, disable the regenerative braking, and uh, they need to do that to prevent the bus from continuing to slip. Uh, some buses that 
that um, that disabled regenerative braking stays disabled for some length of time. And then of course you lose now um, that regenerative braking and you lose range as a result. And so uh, we're fine tuning along with others uh, and mentioned in the, in the report that we have a, a technical call with um, 24, in fact, it's now 26 different transit authorities across North America where we share lessons learned. And we're all kind of zeroing in in this particular example um, to have a regen that's disabled momentarily, but then uh, is re-enabled to preserve the, the the range. And then if it's you know if it's if it sees a slip again, it's disabled momentarily, so it's kept safe, but at the same time protects our range. So that's just one example, but there there are actually many of them. Some of them laid out in the report, and many others that are discussed through that form I described. Thank you. Next uh, person to ask, Commissioner, to ask would be Commissioner Osborne, followed by Commissioner Carroll. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, most of my question um, that I had, uh, you answered uh, for Commissioner Bradford because I was uh, reading this and, and wondering, are, are we too far out in front on this? Um, and as you noted, we're sort of seeing big technological improvements almost in real time as we're going through this testing. Um, so my only add on, because you answered most of the question, would be if you are also seeing costs coming down as more and more of these buses are getting deployed, both you know in our city and elsewhere. Uh, the answer to that, to that is yes. So we are seeing the cost of a bus uh, go down, and as I mentioned, our market sounding, um, we expect to pay on the order of a hundred to two hundred thousand dollars less on average in this procurement than we did the previous. And um, the other question relates to the government funding. Um, is any of the charging infrastructure eligible in the money that the government is putting forward on these e-buses? Um, that discussion, as Rick mentioned, is still ongoing. Uh, we know, and there was some discussion at a previous board meeting about the Canadian Infrastructure Bank's um, uh, offer to uh, finance. Um, the incremental costs of electrification, and there, there, I can speak to that specifically. It does apply to electrification infrastructure. Also, the, the government of Canada's um, public transit infrastructure fund, uh, through which we procured uh, the existing infrastructure, did also apply to buses and infrastructure. Uh, thank you for your excellent work on this, and uh, and for answering my questions. That's all I have. Thank you. Jay. Commissioner Carroll's next. Sorry, I'm Thanks. On. <laughs> no problem. Uh, Mr. Case, I, I'm going to change my questions because I, I'm feeling a bit of uh, a nervousness from my colleagues um, about the fact that these these uh, vehicles are, are going to be continually continuously improved. But if we look at where we are now, um, you've already outlined in an earlier question that we, we have we have to place an order. We we we're not going to have them delivered in time if we don't. We we actually to really be safe should have ordered these about a year ago um, for the timeline in which we we need these vehicles. But um, in maybe you could give us a comfort level. While there is going to be continuous improvement, we're looking at vehicles that are already you know ordered delivered and in service in other cities, are we not? Yeah, for the most part, that's true. So the, the vendors that we have um, uh, uh, today uh, have continued, of course, since we bought uh, the buses um, to, to, to develop their product and to deliver to others. Um, there are, uh, I mentioned Nova Bus uh, is uh, mm -hmm. starting to, uh, is about to come to market with a long range electric bus, but they have been making short range or opportunity charge buses for many years already. And um, right. there are, uh, as I mentioned, two additional uh, kind of upstarts. Uh, so those ones are, I wouldn't say that they're tested and proven. And so if they prove through, if they bid and if they prove through that um, that procurement uh, to, to pass all the, you know, the, the requirements, that negotiated RFP, we may want to take on some small number to learn learn from that, but we would have to mitigate the risk that you're describing uh, by managing the, the number. 
but you still have uh, you still have plenty of knowledge. You, the, the comfort you have to proceed with this tender is that you evaluated the performance of of the same buses we are testing or or their latest version in other cities, including American cities. You you in in the study you name you know um, Chicago and other right. places. So it's not as if we're buying something that isn't already in service. That's correct, and we're. Um, right. I would just add the only thing to add there is that uh, the lessons learned we share across all of those transit agencies. Right. And so, you know, we're learning from them, they're learning from us. And that's largely what's giving us the confidence and the fact that we have right. business partners in all three vendors who are uh, very eager to improve their product and their service. And they continue to do that. So we're, we're confident okay. probably because of, of that vendor relationship. So maybe you could talk to us a little bit about the NRFP. Because I think, uh, well, well, Commissioner Min and Wong was asking about that. Uh, a negotiated RFP is is a particular animal. Uh, mm -hmm. It's a little different than a usual RFP, and it it takes into account this issue of of the piloting and data that's been gathered has to has to enter into the conversations that you're going to have in a vendor open house and then negotiate back and forth with them. That's that's a little different because of the pilot, is is it not? Yeah, we've had market sounding with them uh, already with all the vendors uh, through an open call for uh, request for interest. Uh, but also, um, you know, a traditional RFP, which we used to buy uh, vehicles with, really means that you, you compile your, your uh, technical requirements, your commercial requirements, you go to market, they, they bid, um, you go through a, an exercise of evaluation, and if they, if they pass, then they pass on to the next phase, which is usually a, right. a, you know, opening the envelope to understand who got the best price. Um, in the case of a negotiated right. RFP, um, we set out our requirements. Then we sit with each of the vendors individually to understand their uh, comments to those requirements, both commercial and technical. And we understand right. best, you know, what's going to work best for us in terms of our business part, our, our, our uh, business requirements, but also. Uh, what's common among them that they may all be asking for. And so from a business perspective, you know, we can, we can at that point revise our requirements, issue that same set of requirements to all the vendors, and then they bid on that. Okay, okay. And I just have one other question, Madam Chair. I, I seem to be getting the long answers. <laughs> the last one bridges us from here to, to the framework. Um, is it that process, that NRFP process, allowing you to, to make sure that you've got the best thing, to have that kind of control, is that why when we look forward to the framework, we see that, that one of the options that you looked at with, with uh, Thessal and with OPG was, was a, a, a contract bundle whereby they, they would even, we'd be leasing all the infrastructure and the vehicles and they'd be owning them. But we've settled on we're, we're going to do the infrastructure framework with them, but we want to buy and own these vehicles. Is it the control you have in the NRFP process? Is that's, that's what led you to that decision between no. the two recommendations? No, sorry. To, so to be clear, the NFRP process is to be applied to the buses themselves. Yeah. The, yeah. the, um, the OPG uh, TDC vessel framework for agreement, the contract bundling model that you're describing, OPG is not proposing that model. That's a model where, uh, and some bus vendors are offering this model. Uh, in, in fact, it is typically oh, okay. a bus vendor who's saying, I'll do all the infrastructure for you and I'll provide you the buses and you can lease it from us. The issue with that model, the biggest one, is that you're locked into that bus type, right? Um, yes. And, that you're, and you're locked into um, a system that is designed to work between uh, your infrastructure and that one bus type, as opposed to between that infrastructure and all bus types. And the advantage of having a separate bus procurement and a separate, sorry for the long answer, and a separate um, no, no, infrastructure okay. infrastructure um, uh, engagement is that, uh, you know, 80% of our capital funds are actually on the, uh, on the, um, on the buses, not on the infrastructure. Right. And so we want to maintain competitive procurement there. We also don't want to put all of our eggs in yeah. one basket in terms of like one bus OEM. Okay, that's that's much clearer. Thank you. I because I'm not going to lie to you that the framework item, the next item, that was a awesome. tough slog. You've just made it clear. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Pam. Thank you. Uh, I had questions, but Commissioner Lalonde stole them, so uh, he's done that before. 
next time I'll speak before him, that's for sure. I'm gonna bar him from asking questions. Good questions, everyone. We're gonna to move to speakers. Uh, Commissioner Bradford's up first. Uh, thanks very much, Madam Chair. Um, and uh, thanks, Bem and the, the TTC for the update on this, uh, the findings, it's very exciting. I do have a motion uh, that's on the, the screen here. Um, and it's just asking for the next update on the e-buses and green bus program overall to, uh, to just include a fleet plan with the current stock, potential allocations, priority routes, um, at, as such time that we receive the additional supply of e-buses. Um, you know, I think it, it's important to see those things together and understand it in the context of the, the route planning that goes with the new capital investment in these buses. So, so that's what that's about. Um, it's great to be on the TTC board for a variety of reasons, but, you know, uh, we can certainly be proud of the investments, uh, the bold steps that we've taken on the electrification of our fleet leading here in North America, as we've heard today and before, and this, this really doubles down on that investment. Um, we, we are leading on reducing carbon emissions, and uh, I think that that's something that we can all really be proud of. Um, the TTC continues to carve out space in what is going to be a transformative and uh, really evolving technology. The evolving piece is important though, um, and it's, it's key that we mentioned that. It was highlighted in both the presentation and the report. Not all e-buses, of course, are built the same. Um, and any historical review of low or no carbon vehicles shows us the, the positive advancements that have been made uh, with respect to efficiency, with respect to reliability. We're seeing that range is improving so that these buses can stay out longer. We're seeing that charge times are decreasing so we can, we can get them back out into service quicker. So all of that stuff is really positive. I thought it was interesting, again, that uh, the electric motors uh, are performing really well and we should take confidence in that. Uh, BEM's uh, responses to some of the questions there the other pieces about the buses, corrosion, things like that, where there are some deficiencies that have been identified through the study. Uh, they're confident that the, the manufacturer selected will be able to address that. And, you know, I think we have to trust in that recommendation. Um, the technology and the economics of, of e-buses are also evolving. And, um, you know, I, I'd echo Commissioner Lalonde, who succinctly captured this in his comments today. Um, having the procurement updates and reports uh, looped into the broader direction that we set here as a board, paints a, a much more detailed picture of how we're enhancing our transit system uh, and supporting cleaner technologies. I think that's great. Part of the work ahead for us as a board and a commission and the TTC as a whole, uh, as always, is about fine tuning that rider experience. Um, and we heard from Emily today about the importance of accessibility on these vehicles. Um, that's certainly an area that requires great attention to detail. Uh, BEM acknowledged that as well, and uh, do appreciate Emily jumping on the line today here to share uh, share their experience. And that feedback is is really important for us. So good to hear on that front. And uh, you know, I'm glad to see that the the procurement foresight from the TTC uh, is is evolving. It's moving forward. The timing, I understand uh, we need to move this forward today. Uh, and so I'm happy to support the, the recommendations in the report. That's it from me, Madam Chair. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. Um, Commissioner uh, Denzelman and Wong is next. Thank, thank you, Madam Chair. I, I'm really happy that we're, uh, we've gotten this far. Um, I can tell, I was the person who brought this idea to the commission about three or four years ago. Um, and uh, I, I got this idea because I went to Shenzhen in China and their whole entire bus fleet, 16,000 buses are, were all electric. And uh, so I came back here and did a little bit, bit of research and thought to myself, could we do this here in Toronto? Um, and, you know, I learned from by and large, a really good report by Columbia University that um, we weren't gonna save any money that the running a bus for 10 years when you take capital and operating is pretty much the same running a diesel bus is the same as running an electric bus it's just that the electric bus you got to pay for pay more at the front end and the electricity is cheaper where on a diesel bus it's a cheaper vehicle but you pay more um, on the fuel but the greenhouse gases uh you know the the win on the greenhouse gases 
was uh, unassailable and significant. And then I learned that um, for municipalities, uh, what runs on four wheels, uh, that's where you get your biggest savings in terms of greenhouse gases of anything that that the city does. And so to me, the business case was made. It wasn't, uh, you know, to what I see most of the time is uh, environmental initiatives that are made out of fairy dust rather than ones that actually make good a good business case. This made a great business case. And so we had to come to the commission and I remember ta uh, starting this at one commission meeting and showing it to commissioner. It was it was a while ago, showing it to Commissioner De Laurentiis. She, she liked the idea. I um, mean, showing it to former Vice Chair Heisey. He liked the idea. And then I enlisted former Commissioner to Bearmaker, and he loved the idea. And that's uh, the commission itself back then didn't want to do it. Like the public service there, they didn't want to do it. Too much of a risk. No one else had done it. And the real challenge with Toronto doing it was the weather. Because in warmer climates, and it, it was an easier sell because the technology was proven. But we took the risk. We bought 60. And here we are. Um, and we're kind of, we've pierced through many of the problems. And we're going to, we're thinking about making a good order. So I, I, I really think this is a good news story. We, we, we took a risk. Um, we, took, we took a bit of a jump. Um, we were the first jurisdiction, you know, coal jurisdiction in North America to try this. And oftentimes the first adopter, you know, really gets into some level of trouble. And what you hear at the city of Toronto and the TTC is we're never the first adopter because we're too big to fail. But here we are and um, uh, we took that risk. And, and I think that, you know, uh, we stand to benefit. Technology is evolving. Um, and, uh, you know, I compare this to satellite dishes. The first satellite dishes you had to pour concrete and the satellite dishes were as big as your house. Um, and now satellite, you know, satellite dishes like the internet is like, you know, little boxes and things like that. We're beyond the big concrete satellite dishes. I don't think we're down to the little box, but we're on our way. But I think this is a good initiative where, the, where, where we can make a, a really solid financial business case and save greenhouse gases and, and you know, do something that's realistic to reduce the greenhouse gases in the city of Toronto. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. I'm just going to say a few quick words and that's of thanks. Um, the, this green bus program is really exciting. I know that some people think that I'm very focused on ATC and asbestos removal. And I joke about that all the time because it is great to see these initiatives underway and us moving so quickly even throughout a pandemic. But the thing that excites me most, and I think will be a legacy of this uh, board, is the, the green, green buses. So I really think it's important we thank today Toronto Hydro. I know you can't see me, but I'm having audio issues. I'll just turn it on for a minute. Um, is Toronto Hydro has been such a critical partner in this and such a productive partner, as well as the Ontario Power Generation. I think they're their partnerships have to be applauded on how we collaborated. We all know it's not always easy working with partners, especially with these big, organized, massive organizations. Uh, but here today we see a real success stories story in partnerships and working with Toronto Hydro and OPG. So I just want to hats off to both of you. Thank you very much for collaborating with us and providing that necessary infrastructure that we need to move this program forward. Also the power, power and infrastructure, critical to uh, getting this up and running. So thank you to you. Thank you also to uh, the whole TTC staff who have worked on this, to Rick Leary, making it a priority, to Bam, who you can see knows this file inside and out. Uh, very impressive presentation today. And uh, he's doing a really excellent job on our behalf. So thank you to Bem Case. Um, and I just think it's this kind of forward thinking innovation that we need um, at the TTC. I think it, it really says we're in this century, we're moving forward. Uh, it's the future of transit infrastructure. And um, quite frankly, we have some bragging rights here because with the largest fully electrical mini fleet in North America, standing at 60 e-buses and growing, 
the TTC has already firmly established itself as an industry leader. So I just, this is really something that we can be proud of as a board and the TTC staff are leading the, pro the, um, leading the, leading the parade uh, in North America. And it's not, it's not often we can say that, but today we can. And um, I think it's something we need to talk more about and boast more about. And I hope the media talk a little bit about this because I think it's really important our residents are aware of how we're uh, playing this leadership role. In, and now, you know, adding on these other 300 buses. I think we can't do it fast enough. Um, and I know that 2014 is the big magic year. It is coming quicker than I thought, but uh, we'd all love to see that happen in advance of that. So, and just the emission reduction that we're achieving here is, is um, such an impressive number. So let's continue to put a huge dent in Toronto's carbon emissions and make these meaningful steps towards uh, transform TO goals. We're playing a huge role in that, as is Toronto Hydro. I mean, they're, again, I've met with them over the years. The work they're doing is um, really impressive. So um, I'll wrap up there and just say um, a thank you for uh, this greener model of transit expansion in our city, and let's keep up the great work. I don't think there was anybody else. I didn't have any notes that anybody else wanted to speak. So I'm going to move to um, asking we that we move Councillor Bradford's um, amendment. If you can throw it up on the screen, please, just quickly, so we're all aware of what we're voting on. Thank you very much. I can't see you, but uh, all those in favor of the amendment, opposed, that carries, and then the staff recommendations. Oh, we have to do it separately. We have to do six first, so that's six. That's item six, and now item seven. We bundled the two, but we do have to vote on them separately. Is that fine? Is the clerk just confirm that was fine? I hope you can hear me. Is it, okay, I'm assuming it's fine because I can't hear the clerk. We can hear you, Chair. Okay, that is fine. thank you. And that's fine how we did that. Okay, um, I know we need to break for lunch. Um, I'm just going to suggest that um, because I was having audio, I'm now turning off my screen. I'm going to do it again um, just to help my audio issues. But I just, uh, there was a bit of a mishap at the beginning of the meeting, so I just want to clarify this. Item three is Customer Service Center Interest Arbitration Award. That is part of uh, in-camera discussion, but if no one wants to hold that item, we can dispense of it now. So. That is my question. Did anybody want to hold that item? We have another item in camera. We still have to go in camera. Yes, please. Uh, Madam, Madam Chair, uh, Councillor Carroll, I, I have one or two questions about item number three in camera. Okay, so I'll hold that. And then uh, these other ones I thought were held by uh, deputations, but they aren't. So item eight, financial update for the period ended in December 31st, major projects update. Did anybody want to hold that? No, I'm not seeing anybody. So I'm going to, uh, all those in favor, oppose, that carries. Um, and then item nine, supply of Microsoft software. Was there anybody who wanted to hold that item? Yes, Madam Chair, Councillor uh, Carroll, I have a couple of questions. Okay, Councillor Carroll's holding item nine. And then lastly, a notice of motion impact on rate, uh, ride hailing. Uh, would anybody like to hold that item? Yes, I, I'd like to speak to the motion. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, so we got those out. Okay, so that's clearer now. Sorry about that earlier. Uh, I, we will break for lunch at this time. Um, would Would anybody like to propose a, a period of time that we break for? Is it going to be the traditional hour or any thoughts? Three hours. Three hours. Okay, all those in favor? We'll see you tomorrow, Denzel. Um, could we, could we, could we try for 30 minutes? Sorry, yeah. sorry, is, that, is, that, is that appropriate? 30 minutes? Can Why don't we round it to two o'clock? Okay, so a nod of heads for 2 p.m. We'll see you then. Thanks, everyone. Yep.
Ready to go, Chris Ann? Yes, Chair, we are ready to go. Thank you. Okay, sorry, I'm still having challenges here. So I'm going to keep my video off for now. So my understanding is we're going to start with the CEO's report. Is that correct? And then a cap. Is that correct? Okay, so let's start with our CEO's report. Uh, take it away, Rick Leary. Chair, we may be having audio issues in our boardroom. Just one nope. moment. Nope, there we go. Just got it got back. I apologize. I started. Um, I'll go back. Thank you. Just uh, thank you, Chair. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back. You know, first I'm going to start out by saying I'm pleased to welcome Mary Madigan Lee, our new Chief People Officer here at the TTC. And Mary joined us on here at the TTC on March 8th. Mary joins us from the Greater Toronto Airport Authority and brings a wealth of knowledge as a senior human resources executive who's worked in both union and non-union environments, both in Canada and the United States. As Chief People Officer, Mary is responsible for all aspects of the people group's management and planning functions. She's accountable for providing high quality strategic and operational direction to the departments reporting to her, namely human resources, operation training center, employee services and systems, policy development, and investigative services. So I want to say welcome, uh, Mary, if you can give us a little wave, it's uh, welcome to the TTC. Uh, it's great to have you here. The next uh, person I'm going to introduce you met a little bit earlier, and uh, it's Keisha Campbell. Keisha is our very first ever Chief Diversity and Cultural Officer, and Keisha joined us here at the TTC on April 1st. Keisha brings an extensive experience in all matters when it, relating to diversity and inclusion. You know, what really impressed me uh, most about Keisha coming from TD Bank is her ability to build consensus and act as a trusted advisor who has a skill set to influence and drive diversity and inclusion strategies, objectives, and governance. Keisha leads the new diversity and culture group made up of diversity, talent management, as well as human rights and investigations department. Keisha has end-to-end -end accountability to lead, develop, review, implement, and manage all policies, programs, practices addressing anti-Black racism, diversity and inclusion, as well as recruitment and outreach. Now, I'd also say you may have seen Keisha uh, on CT, uh, City TV last week doing her first media bit for the, the TTC. She's a great job and demonstrated professionalism on, on camera. So I want to welcome you as well, Keisha, and thank you for joining the TTC. I'll give you a little wave if you can, uh, if you can wave as well. Um, next, this one's uh, a little di little different. Uh, this is commissioners. I want to uh, please join me in wishing the very best in retirement to TTC General Counsel and Head of Legal, Brian Leck. Brian has been our top legal mind since January of 1999, and he's bidding us a farewell at the end of this month. Brian has served the TTC for more than 31 years, first joining us as a litigation lawyer. Now, prior to joining in 1989, Brian worked in private practice where he successfully handled numerous trials and arbitrations on the TTC's behalf. Brian serves in other leadership uh, capabilities as well, the Toronto Coach Terminal, the Canadian Urban Transit Association, the TTC Pension Fund Society, as well as the TTC Insurance Company. Now, I would tell you that um, Brian's accomplishments are way too many to, to mention and list out here, but I do wanna tell you that what stands out most uh, is, is for me has been about Brian's push for the TTC to be best in class when it comes to safety obligations. To Brian, safety is not just about legal responsibility, it's about a moral imperative. Known for his calm and convincing tone, Brian has given many speeches and presentations within this organization, reinforcing the importance of integrity, accountability, and care when it comes to building a safe culture in the workplace and serving our customers. So on behalf of the entire TTC organization, Brian, I just want to wish you a very best and hope to see you back post pandemic uh, for a proper and in-person retirement send off. I'll let you know, my friend, I personally am going to miss you. So uh, thank you, Brian, for your time at the, the TTC. And if I could just ask for people to uh, give Brian a, an applause, I'd appreciate that. Woohoo! Thank you, Brian. Commissioners, I'd also like to introduce the new look uh, CEO's report, which we launched this month. As always, the CEO commentary will continue to provide newsworthy and forward-looking information. 
but after consultation with TTC staff, the executive team, and some of your feedback, commissioners, as well as a review of performance reporting best practices from our peers and transit agencies, we've developed a streamlined report with content that better represents the TTC and is more closely aligned to our strategic objectives. Now, this is our first iteration of this report, and it will evolve as we continue towards uh, a vision of a modern transit system. So any feedback that anyone in the commission or even the public for that matter that you have, we would welcome that feedback. Now, given the pace of change during COVID-19 pandemic, the TTC is working to empower our customers to make more informed decisions about their journey on the TTC. To do this, we will be making bus occupancy data available to our customers, ensuring they have the right information, the right place, and the right time. TTC customers using Rocketman and Transit mobile apps will have access to real-time bus passenger count information to help them better plan their trips. And I'd let you know, we intend to make this available and go live on this Friday. You know, working in partnership with those app developers, the TTC will provide them with secure data streams from our next bus system that will then be translated into an easy to read three tier notification system using one, two, and three person icons. The Rocketman app, and the, I'm sorry, the Rocketman and the Transit app are available on the Apple App Store as well as the Google Play Store. So we just tell people this is just one more tool we're making available to our customers to help them make their choices about planning their, uh, their public transit journey. Now, Commission, is just a quick update on the uh, extended closure underway on line one between St. George and St. Andrew stations. You know, as of yesterday at Queens Park, you can see in the, uh, in the slide above, the entire northbound platform level was prepared for asbestos removal and pre-contamination inspection was completed ahead of schedule. And now at St. Patrick, for instance, 573, and I've given you specifics because that's what they gave to me, 573 wall panels were removed at track level. Now this uh, closure began on, the, on April 12th. And additional work that we're working on as well while we're doing asbestos removal is the tunnel lining, tunnel lining repairs track upgrades and station cleaning is progressing very well and regular subway service is scheduled to resume on april 22nd now just uh finally when this board met last month we promised you that the new bus facility uh, would be up and running in north scarborough uh, by this meeting mcnichol bus division or garage operations began on sunday march 28th and the new complex near kennedy road in uh, mcnichol ab is a 29,000 square meter and built a Toronto Green Standard. It's now home to almost 600 operators and 90 maintenance workers. I wanna say thank you to uh, Mia Tori and Scarborough Councillor Nick Mantis for helping us officially open our new bus car facility with a modest ribbon cutting and ceremony and plaque unveiling last month. So Chair, that concludes my, uh, my opening remarks. Apologies, members. We're just having audio issues with the chair. Just one moment.
Nothing's happening. It says press one and it registered. No, nothing's happening. Vice Chair, I believe we have you on audio now. Yep. Vice Chair, are you able to speak? I believe we have you on now. Speak. Uh, I, I have. Can you hear me now? Can you? I hear can. Me? Yes. I've, I've called. I've called in. Okay. Yep. All right. Thank so you. sorry about that. This is really. I've never had this experience. Okay. So you can hear me. I'm on phone. Um, so, Councillor uh, Commissioner Lai, I think had a question. Is that correct? So go ahead. Yes. Yes, I do, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, first of all, thank you very much, uh, uh, Rick, for, for the very nice uh, CEO update. I just have a couple of questions uh, here for you. Uh, it's about, uh, I've always been asking about this, uh, you know, the safety because of uh, the pandemic, about wearing masks and uh, the cleanliness. Lai, you, you, you hit your mute button. We, 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 we stopped hearing you. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, uh, Commissioner Carroll. So uh, do I have to start from beginning? Yeah, I do, I guess. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> First of all, uh, just like to thank Rick for your very kind uh, CEO update. I just want, I'm just wondering about uh, this uh, pandemic, uh, the ridership and all that. Um, we're supposed to be communicating to our riders that they are supposed to wear masks. How is that doing? Uh, has most people been wearing masks on the TTC now? Uh, thank you. Through you, Chair, I'm going to uh, pass that over. I don't know if Kathleen or Wendy Reuter would like to uh, take that, the, the latest numbers on the outreach. Yes, um, uh, thank you through you, Madam Chair, uh, it's Kathleen. I uh, just want to say that uh, we do have a graph um, on page 30 um, of our hot topics talking about mask usage and the data just because of print times and that kind of thing is a little bit late and I'm happy to say that our counters who are out there watching can now report that we have 97% compliance with proper mask wearing. And that's because of the concerted efforts of, of um, the city uh, public health team, of the mayor's office, and of course our own communications on the surface. So we're very happy to see that. Yeah, the reason I asked that is because uh, I have a retirement home in my ward and two of their employees uh, uh, has con uh, contracted COVID because they are riding on the TTC. And uh, that actually, you know, raised my question. So are some of these messages being communicated to the uh, to the riders in different languages? This is not the first time I ask. I just wanted to confirm that. Um, uh, we only use English right now, uh, Councillor, but of course for uh, specific communities, um, as we did with the public meeting held in, in your ward uh, for your community, we can provide specific translation if there's a group that you would like us to communicate with particularly. I hope you are doing that with, with graphics. You do have graphics, do you? Like with the English. Yes, so we, yes, we do. Yeah, That's you know, correct. a picture were a picture worth a thousand words. So that is, so it is. I just want I, I just wanted to confirm that. And yes. also the report uh, reference uh, to uh, the bus occupancy occupancy change for low to high demand routes happening this spring. I just wonder what is the impact uh, with all these uh, with the area like in, in Scarborough North. What kind of impact do we do, would I be getting in my in my uh, neck of the woods? Um, I'm sorry, I'm not exactly understanding uh, exactly what your question is. Whether because we're tracking bus occupancy, will we uh, will we respond to it by providing more service? Is that what your question is? Yes. 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 Uh, uh, are you tracking? I mean, like the Finjis bus and all those, you know, very very you know high high demand routes, and uh, are you doing those kind of yes. how's it coming about with Scarborough North? Yeah, uh, that is what we're doing. Uh, I might have to ask one of my operations colleagues to say exactly what we're doing. But the concept of the demand responsive plan is to put the service where it's most needed uh, because of uh, usage by customers. 
And okay, I'll, I'll chime right in if I could, yeah. uh, if I could, Commissioner. Yeah. Um, we have up to 140 buses a day through the demand response program we've put in place, actually taking buses out of the schedule in communities where we have very low ridership. We're up to 140 a day that we're reallocating and putting on specific routes as we, uh, loot, routes as we track the ridership. It's a daily event. Okay. So I, I, I assume that because of the opening of the uh, bus garage on uh, Magnico is going to help things out uh, a lot more, uh, a lot better now. And I think my last question would be for you, Rick, um, about customer satisfaction is uh, at seventy nine percent. What are we doing to to try to in, improve these? Uh, just to you know raise these percentage, like to make it higher. Maybe Kathleen, you can answer. Well, um, I think it's everything that uh, that we've uh, talked about even this morning. Uh, we're ensuring that every single service that touches a customer makes them feel welcome and at home. It can take a bit of delay before we implement something, before we see it in the customer satisfaction surveys, which we only carry out on a um, on an intermittent uh, basis. But um, I'm hoping that you're seeing many things before the board that are improving um, our customers' opinion of our service. Well, I will. I will when I when I it's my turn to speak. I will, Kathleen. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, commissioners, I, I'm going to jump in here uh, while uh, our chair. As uh, audio issues are sorted out, so we'll continue with questions, and I'm going to ask our clerk uh, who is next on the list of questions. The next to ask questions is Commissioner McKelvey. So please uh, go ahead. Thank you, Madam Vice Chair. Um, so thank you for the CEO report. Um, I know that uh, in there it talks about the Wi-Fi pilot and. It was picked up by the media because I guess something went out for RFI or something was issued. So I was just wondering, um, will we see this at the board next month or how will we gain information about what's happening on this? Uh, I'll take that, Commissioner. Um, oh, yes, you, we will be reporting back next month to the board. We put an RFI, you're correct, out uh, recently. We, uh, we want to get a number of different suppliers of, uh, of uh, systems to test the pilot here at the TTC. Uh, and then possibly later on this year, when we have a better understanding of what's available to us, um, then we'll put an RFP out for a, a final solution and then bu budget it for the 2022 budget as well. So you'll hear about it shortly. Okay. And then I just wanted to know about staff accommodations. You know, we get three hours to vote. Like, well, what are we doing if people can't get vaccines at, you know, regular times, et cetera? Is there anything being done or, um, or is there advocacy to have? Uh, you know, mobile clinics, et cetera, for workers. Um, how are you dealing with uh, vaccine rollout? Well, I would tell you, uh, Councillor, through you, Chair, I will tell you, Councillor, that we, like we've been doing the entire pandemic, we're trying to be as accommodating as possible to all our employees, recognize the importance to them uh, with the, the issues that we're having regarding the pandemic. Um, we continue to uh, message even more recently, just late last week, about the schedule of the phases and the stages within the provincial uh, framework for. Um, for getting the vaccinations. Uh, we even more recently have had discussions with Toronto Public Health about what type of possible mobile units. Uh, but a lot of it, as you can imagine, is based on the supply of the vaccines coming in. So there'll be, there'll be more uh, as we find out more through Toronto Public Health. Okay, and what are we doing to help workers if they've been told they've been in contact with a case and they need to, to stay home? Um, how are we assisting them with that? Uh, I'm going to let Betty give you an overview of uh, the the, the uh, safety officer, if you wouldn't mind, Betty. Uh, I mentioned that how accommodating we're being, but uh, for the we're taking this very seriously here at this organization and uh, making many people uh, stay home. Um, hi there, through the chair. Thanks for the question, uh, Commissioner. Yes, in terms of as soon as we find out we have a positive case in the workplace, we do an extensive contact tracing. We work with the work location 
and we find out um, all the close contacts uh, to that individual and we immediately um, uh, remove them from the workplace and, and send them home to, to begin their self-isolation for 14 days. Uh, in terms of compensation, if that's what you're asking about with respect to uh, support, um, they, they, are, uh, they do get sick benefits. Um, so so they, they, they do get compensated that way uh, during their self-isolation period. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. I'm back. And next is Commissioner Carroll. Well, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. And that, perhaps that's good timing because my, my questions are really just to follow up uh, to Commissioner McKelvey's questions just now. Um, and they're, they're, they're very well placed because you, you actually, uh, uh, Mr. CEO, reached out in your report to, to, to let us know how many people have uh, tested positive while working for the TTC and, and that your wishes are with those still in recovery. And, and so that was a really good and important thing to put there. But my question is around whether or not, I don't know if you've been talking with uh, um, human resources on the city side or, or even in, in the healthcare sector so that we can be proactive. Um, uh, you, you started to answer the question through Commissioner McKelvey. Um, we're hearing that. Uh, I asked the question at council, are TTC workers also essential? Because the premier kept mentioning education workers. Very much so, said the medical officer of health. So I'm wondering what proactive work you're doing. Because we've had, we've had difficulty at the city with people being upset that they didn't get uh, half a day off to go and get their vaccine. When in fact, hospital workers did not either. They had to, on their one day off out of seven, they went and lined up at the Mars Center for the UHN network to be vaccinated. Uh, and, and so there was time wasted on that dispute. Um, are, are we proactively making our own plan, trying to get in place, a, you know, a knowledge base so that the minute our TTC employees are eligible to go and get a vaccine, that, that, that we're not scrambling for, for 24 hours trying to figure out what to say to them? Is, is that work going on now? Uh, Betty, would you take that one for the uh, council, please? Sure. Um, through the chair, um, in terms of, of of the work that we're doing, um, so we're as Rick mentioned before, we are following the provincial. Uh, vaccination plan with respect to the prioritization and transit workers um, uh, are considered to be essential workers as you said and they are part of the group two of the phase two uh, rollout um, but having said that um, right now even before that a lot of our workers are are living in hot spot communities or hot spot poster codes, right? And um, through that, they are already eligible uh, to receive right. vaccines. So we are communicating that to them that um, if they're over 50 years of age um, and they live in hot spot communities, they can get vaccinated and book through the provincial booking system, as well as um, there's the mobile pop-up clinics that are being offered, as you know, for the neighborhoods, hotspot communities over 18. Um, and again, they are being coordinated through uh, TPH's healthcare leadership table. Um, and as, as Rick mentioned, we have, um, we are having discussions with them to see if there, you know, if there's any possibility to, to, um, for any mobile type clinics to be set up at our, our work locations, but it really is dependent on the supply of vaccines. So, so rather than end up in a dispute with our uh, collective bargaining units, are we using them as partners? Uh, and by that, I mean, you know, learning from, from the city's struggles in the, in the beginning of this, are we, are we actually reaching out to ATU and saying, here's the information that, the, that uh, uh, your members, our workers all need to know right now, if they're in postal codes X, you know, the kind of communication that we as counselors are sending out to our community at large, are we sending that out to our workers? Are we reaching out proactively to ATU and our QP locals that associated to say, this is the best information we can give your residents and, and 
gosh, if they're in priority areas, they should go right now because they they're they're essential worker priority. They they'll they'll get a they'll be booked. Are are we proactively going to those uh, those bargaining units and saying be our partner? Make sure people know they can do this on their on their their time off. I'll take that. Yes, we are. Uh, I can tell you that the president of 113 and has become uh, personally uh, friends with having discussions with Natalie, for instance, making sure that they get all the information. We're very fortunate that we have shift work seven days a week. So it's very accommodating for uh, our employees to uh, accommodate the time frames that the province has put together for getting. So we're, and we continue to work with them, those that need to be accommodated. Okay, thank you. Those are my questions. Thanks, Madam Chair. Thank you. Next is um, Commissioner Bradford. So, uh, Madam Chair, just very quick uh, question and uh, congrats on the new report format. Looks great. Um, I, I had a question about the one time metrics and specifically, sorry, the on time metrics. Uh, and specifically, we had had a discussion at the board, I don't know, a few months or, or last year or something. Um, talking about how, how uh, where we talked about the minimum and maximum point uh, monitoring through the new vision system that we were installing at the time. And I was just wondering um, if we're going to see that added specificity for uh, the on-time metrics in, in reports at some point. Jim Ross, would you just uh, take uh, tackle that one for me, please? Uh, good afternoon uh, through the chair. Good afternoon, Commissioner. Um, Hi, could you be a little bit more specific on on what you mean by that? The the minimum maximum for the on time performance. Well, so for, we're measuring it at the end of the line. Um, and well, sorry, <clears throat> the midpoint yeah. midpoint yes. on the routes. Yes, that is in development. So uh, what we have operationally, what we have uh, is that we can get very very granular. What we're trying to do is find the 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 uh, the happy medium, if you will, between just measuring at the ends and measuring at every single stop, for example, uh, okay. which is is you know when you average it out over the whole network in the in the city of Toronto, may not be as valuable either. So what we're trying to get to is a happy medium where we have the midpoint and the end terminals, and we'll combine that or or we'll show it separately. I'm not sure at this point. We'll, we're working closely with Wendy's team, Wendy Reuter, who develops okay. the report. And uh, and we should have something in the next uh, in the next couple of months on that. Okay, no, that's it. it. Thanks. Uh, that's all my questions. Thanks, Madam Chair. Thanks, Rick. Oh, uh, Commissioner Jagiel, you're next. Thank you very much. Um, just a quick question around the data that's being collated from Rocketman, and I'm I'm incredibly encouraged by that partnership. I think having that real time data is so crucial to getting people around the city. But thinking through that technology ecosystem that I think is going to be supportive to the TTC, one thing I'm curious to understand is, are there opportunities to think about deeper partnerships with some of these technology companies that are only here to aid and support the organization? And the reason why I ask that is because I know that Rocketman specifically, just thinking about that app for a second, is, is arguably, I think, the premier app for our customers who are looking to understand when buses are going to be coming to their specific locations, um, if, if, if not the penultimate one. Um, and I do know that they collect thousands of pieces of feedback every day that should realistically be going to the TTC helpline, but instead goes to Rocketman. I've heard that there have been potential opportunities for relationships to be built, but there may have been some hesitancy on the TTC side. Is there a hope to build a better relationship or think through how we utilize these support systems that have been completely created third party to help better our service? Um, thank you for your question, Commissioner. I'm gonna ask Wendy Reuter to answer that question. She's our head of data and analytics. Well, thanks, Kathleen. Um, and thank you for that question uh, through the chair. Uh, certainly, it has been a partnership working with both Rocketman and Transit as we look to bring TTC's uh, customer boarding information into, into their apps. Um, so we're excited about uh, the start of how this relationship is, is working. And we understand from this start that they will be able to have dashboards available um, as we launch this that will help us see the, some of those insights about customers using these apps, what the uptake has been, how it's performing, um, is it informing customers to 
make choices in how they're they're selecting their trips. So, uh, so we're looking forward to kind of th those next steps and how we can partner and leverage their technology to bring information into us as well. Thank you, Wendy. I believe that's it for questions. Unless I'm wrong, we're going to move to speakers. Uh, Commissioner Lai. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just wanted to, uh, first of all, thank Rick for the nice report and it's always nice to communicate uh, uh, regularly with us. And I, I, I just wanted to focus on my, my uh, speaking today on thanking the TTC senior management staff, uh, Kathleen, uh, Llewellyn, Willa, uh, Llewellyn Thomas, and then uh, with uh, her team, Angela Gibson and the community engagement team that hosted a, we hosted a, a town hall uh, on senior affairs on March 31st, and the turnout was was just great. There was 250 seniors that registered, but because of technology, we we managed to get 100 and around 120 in change to get on that virtual town hall. And you have no idea how much these seniors thank TTC for reaching out to them for explaining to them about the, the senior affairs and all these questions they have. And, and we have just overwhelmed response on uh, what a good job TTC has done. And I just wanted to congratulate and uh, give a, a, a vote of thanks to, uh, to the TTC team. And the, the question I asked about customer satisfaction, I think this is, you have 250 more seniors, more happy uh, your customers that are very happy at, at what you're doing in reaching out to them. I just wanted to hope, I hope that this will carry on and uh, we'll, you know, uh, that, that is the only way just to, uh, to increase our customer uh, service is to hear, to listen to people, our writers. So just wanted to give uh, a kudos to, to the team so, uh, so much. I just could not thank you enough. Thank you. And uh, that's, that's all I have to say, uh, Madam Speaker. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we'll move now to Commissioner Osborne. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, yeah, since the board last met, uh, my family had an experience with the TTC that I thought I should share. And uh, because the, the CEO report deals with safety and customer um, service, I, I thought this was the best place to do it. And then Today is a day that uh, Rick saluted Brian Leck for his commitment to safety. So I think it's uh, uh, extra appropriate. Um, on April the 11th, my 26 year old nephew bolted into the Bedford subway station in a state of crisis. And so my sister called 911 and told dispatch that this was a mental health call and that she was also worried about her son's safety. And so she was um, immediately contacted by a police officer who was trained in mental health. And she was also made aware that um, this police officer was working with the TTC. And uh, this is why I'm sharing this because she was both surprised and very comforted by how quickly this was accomplished, how thoroughly the TTC accessed um, trackside both with personnel and with cameras and how coordinated the efforts were between the police service and uh, the TTC in a state like this, which uh, was deemed to be an emergency. So I assume that the TTC staff who worked on this on that day have no idea what happened to Ian, who's my nephew. Uh, and I'm very sad to report that several hours after he left the TTC, um, Ian died later that day. Um, and it's very likely that nobody who worked on it at the TTC knows what happens, what happened to him. And certainly the public wouldn't know about the efforts that are made behind the scenes in cases like this. So I wanted to take this opportunity to talk about the work being done and to publicly thank the staff involved on that day and every other day that there's an incident like this for what they do. Um, we obviously did not have a good outcome on that day, but I think it should be noted that some parts of the system worked. Uh, specifically, the TTC, TTC staff um, policies and procedures did what they were supposed to do, and I think that should be acknowledged. Um, and, you know, today we, we looked at in item five, uh, uh, an area that 
you know, our policies and procedures need some improvement. And I, I think it should be noted that really, as far as, you know, my sister is concerned, Ian's mother, everything that the TTC could have done on that day was done. And so um, thank you to, to all involved. Uh, thank you very much for sharing this story, Commissioner Osborne and acknowledging the TTC's efforts, concerted efforts to assist. I think on behalf of the, of the whole TTC board, I can say along with TTC staff, we want to extend our condolences to you and your family at this very difficult time. But again, I think it's really important you shared that story and uh, we thank you for that. I'm sure that thank wasn't you. easy. I'm sure yeah, that no, was thanks. very difficult for you to do. Thank you very much. So on that note, uh, we're going to move to our next item, which is the eight. I'm sorry, uh, Commissioner Lai, did you have something? To uh, vote to receive the report or before going to the next item? Or? I, I think that's a good idea. All right. Thank you for that tip. Tip of the day. Um, and I guess you'll move it, Commissioner Lai, and all those in favor, opposed, that carries. Okay, now we'll move on to uh, item two, approved minutes of the advisory committee on accessible transit ACAT and uh, are, are there update for 20 to January from January 28th. So this is a for, for information um, item. And so if uh, we could now hear from the chair. Yes, can everyone hear me clearly? I assume so. Um, Thank you, Chair Robinson and Vice Chair De Laurentiis. Um, good afternoon, Commissioners. I just want to congratulate all the new leadership um, that the CEO introduced in his report earlier today. I would also like to send my condolences, uh, Commissioner Osborne, to you and your family, my deepest sympathies. I'll be presenting several highlights from the last two months of ACAT activity. Before I begin, I would like to mention that the ACAT executive is working with staff to revamp the ACAT chair report that is given to the TTC board following the direction taken by the CEO um, and the unveiling of the new report that he mentioned and touched upon. We hope to have something new and improved for the next TTC board meeting, hopefully, that will provide commissioners with a condensed executive summary slash status report of my remarks and or other pertinent information from our minutes. If commissioners have any thoughts or ideas um, on this report, we're open to suggestions and comments, so please let us know. The first highlight that I wanted to bring up uh, to the board is the TTC's new website. As members might be aware, the TTC will be launching a brand new website before the end of this month. As many can imagine, this has been a multi-year undertaking at all levels of the TTC organization. ACAT members have played a pivotal role in ensuring the site is as accessible as possible before launch. ACAT was provided access to the beta version of the new TTC website, where members provided extensive feedback on user experience, usability, and the functionality of the site. There were several areas of comments and suggestions that were provided to staff. In total, 19 unique work items were created, with over 90% of these items being fixed, within the remain with the remaining being investigated at this time. I would like to thank all ACAT members and the TTC's website project team made up of staff from across the organization that have spent significant time prioritizing accessibility as it relates to the new website. We look forward to seeing its launch and being part of any future fixes that may be required over time. My next highlight is the TTC's Real Trans uh, vaccination plan. As many of you know, the TTC has recently launched a campaign and plans uh, and plan that includes Wheeltrans, Wheeltrans' commitment to providing vaccine rides to vulnerable residences of Toronto, including the elderly and people with disabilities. Since mid-March, there have been over 500 trips to mass vaccination clinics and many more that isn't included in this number to pharmacies, clinics, and other sites across the city. Those that are not Wheeltrans customers but believe they can qualify for the service are also being encouraged to reach out to customer service where their application will be prioritized. ACAT looks forward to working with staff on this new initiative and ensuring that Wheeltrans is able to provide this service. My next highlight um, is with regards to the Wheeltrans reservation line. We've seen progressively improved results for wait time since the introduction of the TELUS call center. Call abandonment, abandonment rate in January was 2.25% versus pre-launch of the TELUS contract where the abandonment rate was 26%. Call wait times have also decreased to approximately two minutes on average versus uh, over nine minutes in November. 
ACAT and through the leadership of staff will be keeping a close eye on these numbers to ensure that customers gain access uh, to support in a timely manner. My next um, highlight that I want to touch upon builds upon the major theme of this meeting as it relates to racism, equity, and diversity. ACAT is currently in preliminary conversations with staff around what ACAT's potential role could look like as it relates to these topics. We are committed to furthering any action items that staff see appropriate within the context of ACAT that come from the TTC's own anti-racism strategy, other diversity and equity policies, and the results of the report that was presented this morning. There's a unique intersection between racialized people and disability, especially as it relates to sanism, the discrimination against people living with or perceived to be living with mental health challenges and histories. Racism and disability should not be looked at separately or as mutually exclusive. I think ACAB would welcome any data, information, or conclusions with regards to these topics and how we can best support improvements across the entire system for racialized disabled individuals. We look forward to working with staff and the board and others on this important topic. And my last highlight that I'll be speaking to um, is regarding the interaction between cyclists and wheel-trans vehicles when unloading or loading customers near, at, or on sidewalk curbs. Many wheel-trans customers will tell you stories of cyclists who simply do not stop for wheel-trans customers and TTC staff while squeezing through narrow paths between a wheel-trans ramp or vehicle and the curb. These interactions often lead customers and TTC staff being startled, can lead to injuries, and create unnecessary frustrations and anger between all parties involved. ACAD is currently working with staff to explore different ways to address this ongoing issue, including via advocacy and public communication to change the conversation and perception of the needs to respect, allow, and acknowledge the sharing of these spaces between cyclists and wheel-trans customers. In addition, uh, ACAD members have suggested having similar types of pictograms and indicator lights that currently exist when streetcars open their doors. However, we've learned recently that wheel-trans vehicles are prohibited from implementing such tactic tactics as they would be in contravention to the Highway Traffic Act. So we're currently working with staff to explore opportunities for what can be done. Finally, I'd just like to thank Commissioner Digdio and Commissioner Osborne for attending the last ACAT general meeting. The next ACAT general meeting will take place on Thursday, April 29th from 1 to 3.30 p.m. As always, we welcome any commissioners that may be interested uh, to attend. Thank you all uh, for your time and I'm happy to take any questions if there's any. Thank you, Igor. Do we have any questions for Igor? Uh, I've got a quick one, Igor. So I've heard consistently about these tension points, I'll call them between cyclists and people uh, accessing wheel trans, et cetera. I did actually identify that in a couple motions with transportation, the transportation division at City Hall. My question to you is, have you been included or consulted um, on overall broader issues related to accessibility, the accessibility community in these issues. I'd like um, to know if included you. Through the chair, I mean, I, I would uh, uh, perhaps turn over to staff who have more of um, a historical perspective um, with these ongoing issues that if this isn't the first time they're coming up, who might be able to better respond to if we've been included. I want to say that we have, because this conversation has come up, come up with staff multiple times. Um, I think an ongoing um, sort of strategy is to look at how do we incorporate ACAT even further into those conversations and marry what's happening at the city with what's happening at ACAT so that um, communication lines can be maintained and improved upon. Um, also, just in, as an additional there, um, beyond sort of improving the communication and making this known to the larger public around, you know, respecting wheel trans customers and respecting people who are entering and exiting wheel trans vehicles. I think there's an issue with regards to the regulation and policy with what wheel trans is able to do. So I think our hands are tied in some capacity um, when approaching this issue from a purely uh, regulatory perspective with regards to the item I mentioned um, in terms of putting indicator lights and the limitations of how we can notify um, vehicles and other uh, folks in the public right away to sort of uh, pause and take a moment to stop uh, instead of sort of proceeding through. So because that uh, legal status is a little bit blurry and it isn't very clear, I think that is one of the areas that I think hopefully we can collaborate on together with the TTC board and hopefully the city at, at a certain point uh, to see those changes take place. Okay, thank you very much for that detailed response. Um, I, we are now going to move on, so I would ask for someone on the board to um, move the item before us, which is the minutes of the ICAP meeting. 
Okay, Commissioner Osborne has moved that all in favor. I'm putting up my hand, although I'm not on video. Uh, that passes. Thank you again, Igor, for your presentation today. We're going to move now to item eight, which is a financial update for the period ended December 31st, 2020 and major projects update. I'll just let you know that we've got this item as well as two more, and then we will be moving into camera for two additional items. Okay, so um, Councillor Carroll, you held this item. If you would, do you have questions for staff? No, Madam Speaker, I didn't hold the financial update. I, I did have oh. questions on the next two. Okay, my apologies. Okay, then all those in favor? Opposed? That carries. So we'll move now quickly to item nine, supply of Microsoft software. This one you did hold, so do you have questions of staff? I do. I'm wondering if I could get a little more information about uh, how confident we are about the operating costs of this. There's a significant, you know, we're used to big price tags for tech, but there's a lot of operating cost ongoing here. And so I'm wondering if rather than just give me the name of the programs that we're buying, can you tell me what I'm going to get from this? What more information, what more function as a director of this board, am I going to see for my, for the dollars I'm going to spend here? Shella, you're getting Fortnite. <laughs> well, I'd rather have Fortnite than F cars. So I got some questions. <laughs> Josie Levita, you have this one? Yeah, sorry. I was going to pass that over to Duction, please. Thank you. Uh, through the chair, a uh, majority of the operating expenses are mandatory um, uh, operating costs that are, uh, comes in with the platform purchases that we have to do on the capital side. Uh, it comes with the the software support that the Microsoft provides. It comes in, uh, it allows us to run uh, the equipment on the various equi uh, the infrastructure, as well as it gives us the 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 entitlement to upgrade the version in the future. It allows us by are, are, are there licensing costs that we're putting in the operating budget, or are there human bodies that come with the with the software, and that's why it's operating. It's the license is capital uh, for each cap capital license that we purchase. There is a percentage that is uh, part, part of the ongoing maintenance, the cost that yeah, the vendor charges us. And to me, I view the sentence allows us to operate this software to do with licenses. What is the what what is the actual operating cost? What is it? It's, is it it's, human beings? What is it? It's it's vendor support as well as vendor entitlements for on for so, ongoing use. So, so what we're paying for in operating is a service contract. Correct. Okay. So it's so it's the the uh, uh, service contract, and it's mandatory. It's attached to to the license and the equipment, um, and so that sits in operating. Are the numbers in operating? Are those upset limits for the service contract, or those could grow? Uh, no. So it's based on what we are forecasting to purchase. So it, it's not anticipated to grow. Uh, it's based on what we're looking to purchase. The reason why it fluctuates is the way that Microsoft requires us to purchase the licenses. It's upfront for the three years. Um, and then when the three years is uh, completed, then we would have to renew it for the next three years. So we would purchase it upfront and expense it for the years that uh, we're looking to uh, utilize it for. Okay. And so at the end of the three years, if we're still using the equipment, then we have to renegotiate that service contract operating part. Correct. Okay. Um, and any other changes in the amounts that would happen within the three years? You have to come back to us before you do them. Correct. Okay. And I, in, if, if you could just quickly tell me in what ways are the TTC operations going to be better as a result of this purchase? Uh, so uh, the purchase. I thought she was fin finishing it. Uh, I'm, sorry, just, you... I'm just about done, Madam Chair. I've just been burned so many times before. I just want to know what gets better for me at the TTC as a result of spending this money. <laughs> so, uh, through the chair, um, the purchases of this money is, is as part of the state of good repair uh, to bring our existing environment uh, to the newer version so it's supported by the vendor. The risk is, for example, um, one of the software products that were being purchased with SharePoint. 
and that hosts about two million of our uh, corporate documents. So to, to run that in on an unsupported version, and if there was an issue, it would uh, be a business risk to the organization where uh, the staff won't be able to access their documents. So it's to keep their all our platforms um, up in a state of good repair. The, the Windows Server is actually the host operating system that runs the majority of our critical systems. So if, that, if there's issues of not having that up to date, that could impact the running of our mission critical systems, hence impacting service as well. Okay, thank you. I, I, thanks for the indulgence. Those are my questions, Madam Chair. I, I'm, I'm happy to move it if, uh, if no one else has questions. Okay, great. Sorry, earlier I thought you were finished. There was a lull, but it wasn't a big enough one. Okay, let's, Shelley, uh, Commissioner Carroll is moving this. All in favor? Opposed? That carries. Okay, next item is item 10. It's a notice of motion, uh, which has kind of been back and forth and all over the place. So it's impact on ride hailing on transit. Uh, questions of staff. I know uh, Commissioner Carroll has questions. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, I, you know, I'm going to speak to this and, and, I, and I have already spoken to to the CEO, but I just want to ask because because in asking the questions that I'll be asking of staff, this is information. If I'm right, I, I'm not I'm not putting a crunch time deadline on this, but this is information. This is a sort of study that we really need to do to do to to be able to to continue on with our long term fare strategy. Is it not the change that that the current pandemic circumstances have created in people's lives means that to really look at the post pandemic world of our fair strategy, we, we kind of need this information anyway, do we not? Um, through you, Madam Chair, um, all this kind of information will help us with our fair policy as we think about it and our collection strategy. Um, it also helps us in our projections for how to recover from the pandemic uh, ridership decline that we've had. So um, that all this information is helpful. And and for me, this is anecdotal, but it's the thing that people say to me over and over again when you're having an open pay conversation. You know, guys, uh, what, getting in a ride share is kind of like open pay for me. It's just gonna, it's gonna come out of my bank account. It's predictable. I know what's going on. I don't have to think about my card being loaded or not. So in a downtown short trip, I'm just getting in an Uber. Th those are the things they say when we're talking about open pay. So. We really need to know the impact this is having on us to create the sense of urgency around open payment, whether we get it from our current fair media provider or or the 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 current search we're doing to decide whether or not in fact we want to go it alone in terms of fair media. We kind of need this information to know the impact on our payment method as well, do we not? Yes, and, and uh, so the kind of information is um, customer experience information that will tell us why is it that people are making certain choices and we can always improve our uh, background data on that. Um, the work that was done uh, by the city uh, was very complicated MLS and Toronto transportation and planning work that was done was really just looking at uh, the data of usage and didn't drill, in my opinion, all that far into the customer experience opinions that were driving yeah. people to make that choice driving so to speak <laughs> okay and so last question uh we need these to look at initiatives we've already asked of of you um to know that its impacts but my last question is this the, the city's done some work on this we also have you working on the fair strategy we have you working on a number of things and this is at a time when when the 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 the, the system's kind of in a crisis based on pandemic impacts. Are, is this work you can properly do alone or would it help to have the, the, the third party element of this allows you to get the best information possible? Does it not, that, that was my intention anyway in putting that in the motion. Is that a welcome uh, uh, component of this motion? Um, well, it's, it, it is welcome because it recognizes that if we do this urgently, we might have to stop doing something else. So it's always helpful to have that resource. Um, I don't yeah. know where it's funded from in our budget. The only caution I have, having spoken to my colleagues at the city, um, is that if somebody were to, if a third party wanted to access the actual ride hailing information that municipal licensing holds, there are privacy constraints around that. And so... Oh. 
Um, right. That's something I need to understand further from Carlton Grant and his staff. Um, and right. I only started a quick conversation with them last evening. Super. Okay. Thank you. I'll I'll speak to that for sure when I speak. Thanks, Catherine. Those are my questions, Madam Chair. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I will also ask a couple of questions on this. So just to be crystal clear, especially for our external members on the board, the city is working on a, ra ra a ride hailing report as we speak. Is that correct, Kathleen? Uh, yes, Chair, that is correct. They're uh, updating and uh, getting more information uh, on the one that I think they submitted to the council in 2015. Okay. So, um, and there is, you've already identified it, but I just want to uh, emphasize that there is an availability to city da data for like a challenge, that, like meaning a third party would not be able to access the city's data around this, correct? Uh, my understanding is there are some privacy uh, issues that makes municipal licensing staff able to access it and they can answer particular questions by those who ask them like their planning colleagues or ourselves. So there are limitations. Okay. So uh, if if we if we were to look at this and I know um, Commissioner Kel, uh, she Shelley Carroll is quite interested in this in this issue and rightly so because it will be an issue that's important in recovery. But if we were to move something along the lines of uh, working with and consulting with uh, city staff, like making sure the TTC is at the table in the work that they're doing and basically putting a microscope on the TTC and for our piece of it, uh, for vehicle for hire, uh, would that suffice? Because I, I just concerned about horses, having enough horses, resources and the expertise to tackle something of this nature given the third party issue related to privacy. So would that work if we if we moved something along the lines of studying the impact along with the city of Toronto and their endeavor? Yes, that, that would be extremely helpful. Uh, we have a, a normal working relationship, of course, with transportation services, but to specifically identify the other departments, planning and uh, municipal licensing is, is a helpful addition. Thank you very much. Uh, Commissioner Denzelman along your next. Yeah, I, just through you, Madam Chair, I'm just curious to know what do you hope to learn from this that could be applicable to the TTC, the rideshare activity? I mean, what's the application? I don't understand. Uh, oh. uh, Madam Chair, that, that's a question to staff? Yeah. Yeah, well, it uh, um, as uh, as I mentioned it's helpful to understand the customer experience choices people are making um, and uh, this this information around ride hailing would tell us um, whether they're making the choices because they believe the system isn't uh, healthy for them to ride whether they're making the choice because it's easier to pay um, what the nature of their journeys are so that uh, we can ask ourselves if there's a public transit solution or if there's a unique business partnership that we might get into um, with the ride hailing services that would actually enhance our own ridership and uh, revenue uh, recovery through the fare box. So, but I mean, we're, I mean, in some ways, ride share is public transit. So, I mean, taxis, way back in the day, taxi services were recognized as public transit. I know that because Howard Moscow moved a motion saying that they were public transit and it was adopted by council. So that's, that's that's settled by this council, and so so the what I'm trying to get get to, Madam Chair, and I don't, maybe you know someone from the commission can help me. If the arrangement is as more people are taking ride share, they shouldn't be seen as competitors. They're actually taking pressure off the system. So either if there are more or fewer, it really doesn't matter. I mean, I, I I'm trying to I'm struggling with this idea of. What is it that's useful to you? If more people are taking ride share, God bless, because you know, pre-pandemic, we were complaining that there were too many people on the system. There are this would mean there are fewer people on the system. I think that would be a public good, wouldn't it? Uh, through you, Jerry, if I could answer that. Um, one of the questions that many of us in the industry are talking about is the fact that we've lost such great ridership 
and the uh, the belief is between 23, 24, we can only be getting 84 to 90% of our ridership back. And one of the things that in discussion with staff was, we have to look at every possible area that we're losing ridership. We need to bring people back. And that that's why when the conversation came to me uh, not too long ago, I was in support of, as we're looking at a restart and recovery program to initiate every possible aspect of educating customers on what we do to keep them safe in public transit. It was even looking at hills, ride hailing that uh, has become much more popular in many major cities. And we're having the discussion, how do we get people back from that? So that, that's why I was uh, having this discussion, endorsing what we were doing. Yeah, but Rick, how, you complain that you don't that you don't have enough buses, and that your subways are jammed, and now you want to get more people back. Like, do you see the inconsistency in what you're saying? Uh, through you, Chair. No, you know, at the peak of the peak, we know that we're uh, really uh, have we had great ridership, but there's the greatest portion of the day and, uh, and night, right? We have available space with the uh, the capacity that we put on the street. So that's what that's what we're looking at. Wouldn't you like to see more ride share during crunch times so that there aren't as many people cheek to jowl on on transit? In all honesty, uh, Deputy Mayor, you know, with the effort that we're putting in to improve the reliability of the train system and with greater throughput, as you recall, we were at 17 or 18 trains an hour just a few years ago. Now we're doing 25, 26 pre-pandemic. For me, it was always just trying to improve that service to get people to come and to depend on our reliability that will get them where they need to go. And I know there's a there's an absolute number at the high end at some point, um, but that's what we were, we we're working with. Madam Chair, next time the the TTC Commission comes and complains and they don't have enough buses, I'll I'll remind them of this conversation. Where, they actually want to take more people off the rideshare system. Thank you. Thank you, and we'll move to Commissioner Lalon. Thank you, Madam Chair. I think I wanted to follow up on on your line of questioning, and uh, it's a question of the mover as to whether she would consider it a friendly amendment to um, to ch change the wording around commission and independent third party study. It just seems to me there's questions outstanding as to whether um, making it independent will allow proper access to city information, number one. And number two, I, I wouldn't think we'd be willing to have an open-ended um, request for a study at any cost to uh, to be independent. So I'm wondering if we might just say uh, ask the chief executive officer to uh, to propose a plan for a study of or something to that effect. Uh, but that was my my question slash comment. Um, I I don't think we uh, Commissioner Carroll, you can answer, but you're muted uh, because he did ask. Hey, I was just sort of trying to mine. Is that a question of the mover? Do yeah, you want me to answer? Yeah. So this is a this is a, a the virtual world we're in. He did actually ask, ask to speak earlier. But it was a delay between me and the clerk. Uh, so he, yes, it is a question of the mover. Yeah. Okay. Delayed. So, um, um, uh, I have actually only asked questions of staff. I haven't, I haven't actually gone on the floor to read the motion and move it and speak to it. But I'll answer the question, which is, um, I, I think there are amendments coming to that effect. But in my answer to your question, I'll give you my concern. My concern is this, um, uh, I, the, the transit lens I want to put in this and, and who, the kind of um, uh, terms that the, that the, 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 the transit commission might put around a third party study or around directions to their staff, whichever of these motion passes, I think is unique to the city. I get that the city has this contract about protection of information of the ride sharing companies, but they can, as, as the chair has outlined, or, or as Kathleen said, whomever, that they can sit down and say, here's what we can tell you about the data we, we are privy to. Here's what we can tell you about it. And, and I think that the lens the TTC staff will put on it to inform their fair strategy and inform open pay and all the rest of it is a slightly different. We need to know how ride hailing is is affecting us in different parts of the city in the downtown core for instance in the most expensive part of the city we have right now the lowest ridership our subways are almost empty to the point where people are feeling comfortable engaging in kind of dangerous behavior on them sometimes and 
we're going to have to get people's trust back and get them back on that vehicle to make that a, a, an economically viable service. And so how do they come back if their pattern of travel is now radically changed because the trips are all short? What's happening in the suburbs? In the suburbs, do we have those rideshare companies uh, becoming a major player in first mile, last mile of bus travel? Do we or do we not? I don't know. Um, if so, then maybe we do want to, to entertain some form of livery relationship with them for first mile, last mile, but we don't know. And we don't know what the impact of it would be on, on our city regulated uh, uh, taxi industry. That, that might uh, become a part of the discussion, but we don't know. Um, in the downtown core is the fact that you're essentially open pay paying on your app for those types of rides. The very thing that is causing people to opt out of the TTC and into a car. Is that the most attractive piece? The kind of surveying that a third party might do for us while our staff are busy doing other things will give us all the information we need to build a recovery and post pandemic ridership growth program. Because, you know, with respect to, to the commissioner and deputy mayor's comments, we don't have an overcrowded system right now. And people are making the kinds of ridership behavior changes that I fear might become permanent. And if they do, what's our funding future with other orders of government? What is what is the future of the core downtown subway system? If if we have 40% ridership on buses, but only 20 on subways and streetcars, what's the driver there? What's happening? This study, I think, allows us to look at that and account for it and then begin to, to incorporate it in whatever incentivization we want to use to get people back to what is a social good, our public transit system. All right, thank you. The next speaker, no, next person, I think we were on questions, weren't we? Oh my God. Uh, Commissioner Jagio, you're up. Did you, you're on the list, are you not? Uh, I, I'm on the list, but I'm proposing a uh, a few amendments to what okay. Commissioner Carroll okay. has so presented. Just, I'll come back to you then and I'll just move to Commissioner Osborne. I have uh, comments, not a question. Okay, perfect. All right. So let's move to speakers. Thanks for clarifying that. I, I do have some motions too, but um, where do we start? I guess uh, Commissioner Carol, you maybe want to place your motion first and speak to it, and then we'll go from there. Uh, yes, thanks, Madam Speaker. Um, I think uh, we can consider it read. People have have, uh, have seen the preamble. Um, but I've, I've worded this motion to commission an independent third party study. I, I understand the cost implications and I know that, uh, I know that, that, uh, staff are keenly aware of them. And so they'll, they'll be innovative in their approach. If, if we should go with a, uh, uh, method. Oh, I see that what's on the floor now is an amendment. I'm not actually moving that amendment. So I wonder if we could just have my original motion on the screen. I'm aware that people might be placing amendments afterwards, but I'm interested in the original motion at the moment. Let's start there. Is I, I don't know if it's going up on the screen or not. So I'll go back because my clock has not stopped running. Um, there we are. The reason I worded it this way, I, I've already in my answer to Commissioner Lalonde gone gone three quarters of the way there. Our, our staff have a lot on right now. They are in an ongoing way through Ms. Llewellyn Thomas working on a fair strategy for the future. Um, we know that, that that has a huge role in our intergovernmental conversations. We're about to head into 10 years, and my guess is 10 years of some of the most difficult economic times we've ever been through because I think we all know that when we're all vaccinated, um, we have uh, 50,000 families in this city that are four months or more behind in their rent. So the economy is not gonna go woohoo in, in, in one week just because we hit 70% vaccinated. There will be a struggle back. And so we have to take a new look at our fair strategy. At the same time, we have to look at, have people left for reasons of affordability or is there, are there two worlds now in this city? And for some, um, now they're 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 able to just afford to get on an Uber, and because they they 
they they never regained their faith in the transit system during pandemic times that just never come back. We need to start looking at where do we need to invest uh, in in ridership strategy. This system has always has always made its gains by by working on ridership growth strategy. That's that's how we've done it. We have one in play right now that ends in 2022 that is sort of tools down because of the pandemic. And so what we have to do now is look at all the changes this pandemic has wrought and the, and the years leading up to it as people were starting to look at, at, at ride hailing as their option. Uh, the, 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 uh, the deputant first thing this morning may have had something to say about that, the cost of a, of a monthly pass kind of drove some people to it. I think we really have to look at the interplay between ride hailing and transit systems and, and indeed the taxi industry, if you want to throw that in there too. I didn't put it in the motion. It is, it's a volatile topic, but we have to look at these things in, in, a, in a cool, clean, and I think more objective if you get, get the third party data analysis, just as we just did with the, with the, the, our, our uh, race-based uh, uh, enforcement issues. A third party objectively looking at what the impacts really are and then informing us as we, people who are emotionally invested in this system, because we live it, we run it, we work it, then then pick the best strategies going forward to make sure that, that riders everywhere on the economic spectrum and everywhere in our modes, be it the, the bus network out in the suburbs and, and the core streetcar and subway services, um, are choosing transit first and using those things as a complement to our system, not as a replacement to our system, but getting that objective third party data first and, and, and dovetailing on what the city's doing, but going deeper into it so that we can have it inform our work as a commission, I think is a no brainer. Um, it sounds like people are concerned about it, but I have to put this motion on the table because I, I know we need this to make the best recommendations possible post pandemic. Those are my comments, Madam Speaker. Very much. And I'm actually going to speak next because I have a, an amendment um, that I'd like uh, the clerk to put up on the screen. I'm sorry I'm not on camera, but it uh, doesn't seem feasible for me. Um, so I think this is a bit of broken telephone happening here. And that's actually, to be, to be very honest, my hot mic um, issue this morning was related to this item uh, because I was frustrated um, because city staff, I think, did reach out to us last night when they saw this motion and they reached out to the seconder, Brad Bradford, and that's why you heard me say Brad Bradford, uh, versus they should have reached out to Commissioner uh, Carroll because she was the mover. Um, so I'm not sure exactly how this has happened, but city staff did indicate they had concerns with this motion, A, and B, uh, they had concerns with the data and privacy issues related to that and a third party, uh, which I've kind of explained, I think, through my, my questions. Um, so I have to say, um, I had the exact same reaction that Commissioner Denzelman and Wong had uh, when I first read this motion yesterday or whenever it was in the last couple of days, I, I, my question was to what end? Um, really, what is the purpose of this? Because, you know, some people could argue microtransit is being played out by these individuals, these organizations or the last mile, however you want to term it. Um, but then, you know, I think our CEO thought maybe it wouldn't be the worst thing to find out a bit more about this. Uh, because of our recovery strategy and the bounce back uh, that we will need to entertain or pursue a strategy around uh, how do we recover from COVID. So I actually am more aligned with um, Min and Wong, Commissioner Min and Wong's thinking on this, but my motion just softens the previous motion uh, by taking out commissioning an independent third party um, and my, my position is if the city is already undertaking the cost of this and they have the resources to do this, instead, maybe we just partner with them and uh, make sure we're at the table working with them 
and making sure our voices are heard, which Kathleen, uh, if you don't know Kathleen, she's very good at doing that. But I do worry about city, uh, our TTC staff, just they're, they're dealing with a lot of heavy issues, big lifting happening on their part, coupled with COVID and uh, not just getting through COVID, but the recovery. So I just think from a funds uh, and, and resources standpoint alone, and you know money is tight. We It's not like we have a, an abundance of funds right now. Instead, we have terrible fiscal pressures. I, I think this is a better way forward. But if somebody has another motion or an amendment to this, I'm all ears because we did this very quickly uh, because we were having connection problems. So I'll leave it at that. And uh, thank you for your time. I think there's other speakers on this matter, I believe. Can, um, can, I, can, I, can I ask a question of the mover? Sure. Before yeah. we move on? Um, just before we move on, um, uh, I, I, I'm sure you, you can appreciate that it doesn't feel like a softening. It feels like a changing. It, uh, softening would be uh, different terms of the study, but you're in fact saying, let's not do a study. Um, the word partner isn't in your amendment. Are you concerned that, that this gets interpreted a different way? Because I I, I think I think in uh, having heard what what I what my intention in moving this, you, I'm sure you can appreciate. I don't want to leave this up to the city and get back ride hailing impacts ridership on the TTC, and it's a that's that's the depth of their answer. We we know that already, but we need to know which modes and where in the city and that sort of thing. Are you concerned that the word partner isn't in the amendment, and so they won't? They won't, in fact, be bound to the things we need to know that are listed in the motion. I mean, we can certainly add it. I, like I said, I did this very quickly. Um, but what I was really trying to achieve here is giving the flexibility to staff. Let staff determine the best way forward um, because this this allows them uh, some input and involvement, but um, you know, not necessarily doing the whole kit and caboodle. So that was really my my objective was to to kind of throw this back at staff and let them work with the city on how they uh, move forward. So if I can just ask a follow up question, because um, your your answer it makes it more clear to me why I have to insist that it's not a friendly amendment unless you have the word partner in there somewhere, because I don't want them to just have input. I want them to be able to require that this is information that gets looked at whomever is doing this study. My my own my own preference was to simply not have a deadline on this study and that would help them deal with their own pressures. I, I, I don't need this study to come back to me two months from now. It's whenever they are able to do it. I'm not putting a date on it. That was my approach to flexibility. But your approach I'm okay with as long as this is the information we get. And I think unless they're they're viewed as partnering with transportation, transportation will say, well, that's not the scope of the study we're doing and we, we won't get the information. That's not a softening. That's that's killing this motion. Yeah. So, so put, the, I also, put the word I partner also, in and I get way happier. Yeah, <laughs> I did. toy. I did toy with killing it, to be brutally honest, but uh, I can change the word work with city to partner with city. Does I that, think that sends a message. I'd really appreciate it, Madam Chair. Okay, so let's move on to our our other speakers. So, uh, Commissioner Osborne, you wanted to speak on this, I believe, as well. Uh, yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, in the motion, all of the items that are listed for study um, are really, I guess, amount to data collection and analysis, and. Um, and, you know, that's great if it informs, you know, where service is, is insufficient and, you know, uh, potentially something on fares. But for me, I think one of the keys on this is uh, kind of less data driven and more maybe qualitative is if the TTC is losing um, customers to ride hailing, why? So it's been positive. Maybe it's, it's um, open pay. But we don't know that. And so to me, that would be quite a bit more instructive, or at least as instructive potentially uh, to look into. And, and it may not be precluded, but it wasn't like the what, what's in the motion here is um, looks like it's it, it in a way only going backwards, looking at existing data. And I'm wondering if there is room for qualitative. 
I'm sorry, Madam Chair. It, it's this is kind of awkward. I, I think that's a question of the mover, but but we're we're not really going in that order. Oh, sorry. Okay, that's my bad. I'm sorry. I I, I don't know how you want to handle I it. Think, I, you know what? I think uh, Commissioner Osborne, maybe the staff have just heard what you said. They'll take it into account as they work through this process. I think. Yeah. I think right. Leave it at that. I think one B two covers it, but 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 it, it's a. Yeah, I think I think I can see Kathleen's heard that loud and clear. So I um and we can have an offline conversation, uh, or with you can have an offline conversation with Kathleen. So I think we're all ears on that. That's a uh, good input. I'm going to move now to Commissioner Jagio. Do you want to go ahead? I think you have an amendment. I believe. I'm not sure. Yeah, I do. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, look, I, I I think and what I'm trying to do is trying to understand this. Um, motion from a very apolitical and even from a, you know, away from public service perspective. And there's a couple of things that come to mind. When companies who are smart and are thinking about foresight, when they commission projects and opportunities like this, it's for the purpose of surviving and for future proofing a system. It's how we negate disruptors from coming into the ecosystem and turning services that have operated for 100, sometimes even 150 years from becoming obsolete. Um, so I don't, so I do think that having some insight on ride hailing is is, is a good idea. And I mean, who's, who's to say that it's just stopping ride hailing as we start to see the introduction of shared mobility services, as we start to think about how Lyft and Uber are thinking through their own strategy for mass transit. Right, it's not. It's not a. It's not a bad idea. My my amendments, which I have two here, E and F, and I'll walk through them briefly. It, it's sort of an add-on to um, what Commissioner Carroll is thinking through. I and you know, truth be told, A through D information that likely already exists can be extrapolated for the TTC. Um, you know, I've you know, tr and truthfully, I've done work like this myself for other transit agencies in my work as a consultant. So I can probably brush up some reports if I can redact some information. Um, but what I'm more interested in understanding is we we've got data. We're going to get some insights and likely some implications. But what are some of the solutions that come out of it? Because I don't want this to be a report that just says, well, ride hailing is impacting Toronto, and that's about it. I, I I'd be curious to understand. Um, and, and, you know, if we're considering um, Council or uh, Chair Robinson, if we're considering your motion or your amendment, you know, how, how does the city as well as the TTC think through strategies and solutions to remain competitive in this ecosystem, right? The, the ride hailing companies are not going to go away. And in fact, they're likely going to get bigger and they're likely going to get better. So how do we think about taking this information and coming up with concrete solutions um, that we can implement over several years to start to future proof this? Um, I don't think that's a bad strategy. In fact, every Fortune 500 leader might tell you that it's just good business sense. As we think about the second um, uh, second um, amendment that I have here, this this could be seen as controversial, and I and I completely understand that. But as we start to think about the entire mobility ecosystem, the opportunity to work with ride hailing companies in a capacity that is innovative exists, and countries, if not cities, who are as economically efficient as Toronto have started to think through that, whether it's mobility as a service, whether it's first mile or last mile. I mean, um, you know, uh, Commissioner Denzel Min and Wong, you mentioned, you know, aren't, isn't it great that we have these ride hailing services because at least we're still driving transportation and 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 trying to get personal cars off the road? Um, yeah, ab absolutely. But what, what what is the TTC thinking about when we think through these possible synergies with ride hailing companies? And, I, and I'm not suggesting that tomorrow we go out and build a partnership with Uber, but I do think it's worth uh, good leadership and good management to think through what those possible synergies could be in a way that's mutually economic benefic economically beneficial to the city. Um, so I would encourage that if we are going to vote on a report like this, that we at least try to drive to some solutions and try to drive to some innovative thinking around what could happen. Right. And again, thinking apolitically, thinking very siloed and with my fiduciary hat as a as a as a as a commissioner for the TTC and thinking about the TTC's bottom line, especially as we think about the fact that our our revenue coffer, 70 percent of it comes from um, riders. Right. We're, we're in a unique position when we think about our North American peers. We need to be thinking about these pressures, these challenges that are going to impact us um, very soon. So I, I would recommend that we think through some of those strategies and and move these uh, two amendments. Okay, thank you very much, Commissioner. Uh, that was our last speaker. 
Um, I don't see any questions for the commissioner, so we're going to move to a vote. Um, so if the clerk could put the amendments on the screen. And then we're moving into, just as a heads up, into closed session. So this is the first amendment, uh, which I believe Commissioner Carroll said was friendly. All those in favor, opposed, that carries. And the next amendment, if we can put it on the screen, please. And here we have the last amendment from Commissioner JVO. Any, I uh, know, all those in favor? Opposed? I believe that carries. All right, so thank you for that. And we're gonna move on to um, a closed session. Sorry, so Chair, I one moment, just uh, item as amended. Oh, item as amended, good point. Thank you, all those in favor? Opposed, that carries. So I'm gonna quickly read um, the resolution to recess. Uh, members of the public, we will now be moving into closed session in, on items three and four of this agenda. We will return to public session and the live broadcast at the end of the session. Having said that, I will warn you that there are no more items before us um, in for public purposes. And so um, would there be, there'd be about a five minute pause. So we'll say um, we'll resume in five minutes. Uh, because it takes a little bit of time technically for the clerks to change over to an, a closed session scenario. So uh, everybody take a five minute break and we'll see you back here. Here we are live. Thank you very much, that's great. So uh, I'd like to move item three and four from confidential se session. Um, would like to adopt them. So we'll do item three first, adopt the report, Customer Service Center Interest Arbitration Award. All those in favor, opposed, that carries. And item four, ongoing negotiations update, ATU Local 113 and QP. All those in favor, opposed, uh, that carries. I want to thank everybody for our meeting today. We've got a lot accomplished, a lot of uh, challenging news and good news um over the course of the day but lots of great questions and remarks so thank you everyone and uh we're now adjourned all the best thank you thanks, thanks everyone